Thank you. And is there any public comment on the closed session agenda items? There is not, but can we take roll call real fast? Perfect. President Holt. Present. Vice President Wedge. Present. President or Clerk Brickler. Present. Trustee Roths. Present. Trustee Dowd. Present. All right. And thank you. And seeing as there's no public comment on the closed session agenda items, we will recess the closed session and reconvene an open session at seven o'clock.
All right, it's seven o'clock. We will reconvene an open session. And at this time, if you'd please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Can we ask um, Sue Thompson to lead us as one of our guests? No. Nope. Sure. Would you be willing? Oh, it's over here. Oh. I got to you the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. And no action was taken in closed session. And sorry, this is still President Holt. And I move that we approve the agenda. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. All right. And moving to item six, uh, any public comment on items not related to other board agenda items? No, we have not received public comment. Okay. All right. So moving on then to item 7A, AUTA. Good evening, President Holt, board members, and interim superintendent from Chersia. We have officially opened the school, and we are on day number six. It is the season of back to school night at all of the sites. I hope you as board members can visit some of the sites. With the school consultant <laughs> and with teachers, we are trying to move forward and focus on our students. The problem is, <clears throat> how can we do that when we constantly have issues with facilities? At Albernell, there were work orders that were placed in June for the water and faucets. In August, there was still no water in several faucets. And if you can remember the first several days of school, it was 100 or over 100. Water was brought into the classrooms, but not all of them that were in need. Eventually, we did get water. Another issue is in a kindergarten classroom, there is a wall that is soft due to possible water damage. The whiteboards in the classroom, in addition, when you write on them, bent. At Edie Kane, there is a classroom that is completely void of a working air conditioner. When the teacher <clears throat> was able to find the temperature, it was over 85 degrees in that classroom, and it has not worked for the past week and a half. How is that a comfortable learning environment for our students? The science classrooms are cleaned every other day if the students are available at night, but this is becoming a serious safety issue when walking in the classroom, especially when, when students are dealing with chemicals. <clears throat> the faucets at Skyridge are being replaced. Teachers are being told that they can't use them for up to two months. This is not acceptable in any classroom, let alone a TK or a primary classroom where faucets are used in a daily basis. The bottom line is that these issues are not the fault of the principal. principals. They've reported their issues at their school sites. It's not the school site's fault. They've done all they can. The issues are recorded and sent to the appropriate departments. <clears throat> the issue lies with facilities and getting things done in a community. Where, where are the records of the maintenance for the agency unit? When will work orders be done from June and when will they be addressed? In addition, when communication goes out about these issues <clears throat> to parents and families and staff, it should be from the district. <laughs> This goes back to clear and transparent communication with all stakeholders to have access to critical information in a timely manner. Respectfully, Sarah, we would be to make us this. Thank you. And then do we have CSEA connected with us? Okay. So moving right along, the independent reports. <laughs> As um, President Liebert said, um, it is nice to see kids back and to have our kids happy and smiling and see all the parents. Um, I was able to go to back to school night last night, um, and I'm happy to say that our human resources department is there to make sure that um, those who wish to volunteer have access to um, fingerprinting and paperwork and that type of thing. Um, so I'm very excited to see our staff. I've missed everybody. Um, that sounds kind of corny, but honestly, you know, over the summer, we're working really hard trying to get things back up and running, lots of things. Um, and it's just nice when everybody comes back and we can see everybody and, um, and see the smiles. Thank you. This is President Holt again. Um, and I'm just saying that for the, the translators. I don't know if you heard that part. We've, that's why we're saying our names. 
Uh, yeah, again, welcome back. Right. Glad to be back in the school year. Um, happy to see what the district's been doing, uh, providing transportation to SOF 40 families right now, uh, or taking advantage of the, the busing vouchers. Um, and uh, appreciate the work getting ahead of the lead testing um, on the on the faucets and other uh, fixtures in the sinks. So getting ahead of that. So we do have water into the classrooms. So really appreciate that. And moving on to other board comments. Uh, this is uh, Vice President President Wedge. Uh, just one comment. Um, actually, I was informed today. Um, I think it could be really good for our district that um, I guess um, the church. Uh, what is it? Um, um, what's the big church? Uh, um, they actually reached out and they're looking at uh, wanted to uh, use the EV Kane site and um uh catholic church which church it's oh, the, the big no it's the big church in bayside that's it thank okay. you bayside i'm not familiar with bayside at all but um so i think that can be a good thing for the district because i know a few other areas that bayside has come in they actually do a lot of community support i know it was brought up you know as far as the track and field and stuff so so i'm kind of um excited to see how that's gonna you know unfold of them coming <laughs> in and ut utilizing the site so do you mind if do you mind telling us more about what you heard about their interest? And in I just heard that they contacted the district and they was they want to um, move up here to Auburn and they're looking at EV Kane, you know, um, to use on the weekend, um, oh. you know, the site on the weekend. So and um, what I know about Bayside, they're very uh, uh, community oriented and um, they really like to pour into the community and really help out in the schools and whatnot. So I think it could be a good thing for the district if it works out. Thank so. you for clarifying. Yep. That sounds really exciting. Can't wait to hear an update. I guess we're going down the line. Uh, this is Sarah Brickler. Um, I first wanted to thank our staff for working so hard to prepare for this 23-24 school year. Um, initially, I was thinking it was mostly the staff that were moving from one closed site to a new site that were primarily impacted. But then I'm I'm learning that staff have been moving within sites and having to pick up their classrooms and that there's just been a, a lot of movement to try to reconfigure and best utilize our space. And I know it's just a tremendous amount of work. And um, I just appreciate staff's you know, the, the commitment of our staff and their flexibility and how they've really focused on um, on preparing our school sites for our students and, and um, trying to move forward in the most kind of positive um, manner. Um, I want to thank the Leadership Auburn class of 2023. They've, um, I know that their projects are still underway, but um, just as a, as a midpoint, and I've heard that they've raised over perhaps $20,000 in donations. They've made a number of improvements to the EV Kane campus. Um, I saw a beautiful mural that's in progress and um, a garden area that um, will be wonderful for those students and uh, a ton of updates to the existing pollinator and native gardens that were put in place years ago. So I love seeing something that a grant funded that's being revitalized. Um, I wanted to congratulate um, Trustee Ross because she was just recognized by the Arts Council of Placer County as one of 40 icons of art and culture in Placer County, which is just a tremendous um, recognition. And she's brought a lot of uh, visibility to the visual and performing arts in our schools. Um, I wanted to speak against the concept of ratification for our contracts. I know that we didn't have a meeting in July and that business needed to be conducted um, since we haven't met in, since June. Um, but now we have a series of contracts that are in place that are being brought to the board that have already been um, um, finalized. And it seems that if I were to, you know, ask um that there there's one you know there's some, there's an item in particular that you know I would I would have pulled if it were a contract and um it feels like at this point it would cause a lot of disruption if I were to do that so just whenever possible I think as a board it would be beneficial to be able to um view the contracts and vote on them before they have been finalized um and the last thing I wanted to say is just that um you know, some of the facilities issues that we just heard about are new to me and that um, it's really important that we get updates about the status of where our schools are. I know a lot of work was done to prepare the school sites. There was a, a lot of renovation that was required. And I know we've been working for some time to um, prepare the school sites, but it, it's really important that we understand whether or not we have safety issues on our campuses. 
Thank you. Um, this is Trustee Ross. Thank you so much, Clerk Brickler, for even bringing that up. That was amazing to stand alongside such incredible, incredible community advocates and leaders. So I really appreciate that. Um, I want to, and then you mentioned Leadership Auburn. So we are almost done. This has been such a fabulous, phenomenal year. We're in the middle. I think the last thing we need to do is finish our mural and then we're going to add a pickleball court. And um, I really have to shout out the Placer County Master Gardeners. They are just phenomenal. And the fact that we have such community support is incredible. They're not just at EVK, they're also at Sky Ridge. They were at Alta Vista. And hopefully they can even help us maybe at Auburn Elementary. At Auburn Elementary are they okay? Like Perfect. So um, I really want to shout them out because that's been a huge huge collaboration project. We still have a little more money left. And so we're looking to get some arts um, equipment, art stuff, as well as some music equipment. So that'll be cool. And then um, we have Kids of Palooza. I'm so excited. I wish I had like a 30 second commercial ready for you, but I don't. So just show up September 7th. It's in collaboration with ARD Park. So it's at the Recreation Park. And I will make sure to get flyers out to everybody. But that is September 7th from 4.30 to 7 o'clock. And it's arts, music, and wellness. And we have people like Communities Kids and APD and AUTA. Blue Door is going to be a part of it. Um, so it's just an amazing resource fair, but with interactive stuff for children. And then um, I have to shout out Mr. Kins with his robotics class and all these after school programs that are going on for parents that are paying attention to this. Please, please, please look at the clubs that are happening because there's so much cool stuff happening in our schools. Um, we're going to start a drama club at Auburn Elementary with Sarah Liebert and Lisa Sassman and I, and then we'll have something going on at Sky Ridge again with Mrs. McDonald and Mr. Packhauser. Packhauser. Um, so we will get that going shortly. And at Evie Kane, we'll have Beats Lyrics Leaders with our youth ran record label. And we just got a really great donation. Um, shout out to Seven Mindsets for donating money so we can get equipment for Beats Lyrics Leaders to work with Evie Kane. Um, and then last but not least, Blue Arts, Blue Line Arts, they're in Roseville and they have this amazing program for Title I schools. So any teacher can contact them and get a workshop and they can get um, a tour and they will reimburse us for the bus. So we don't even have to pay for a bus. Um, so please, I hope Michelle and I can work something out to get out to everybody so we can take advantage of that because that's just such a cool thing to be able to have. Other than that, Thank you for, th shout out to the superintendent for getting this school year sh started. Like that is a huge accomplishment. So thank you so much. Um, trustee out here, um, absolutely welcome back to school. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. Um, went to the popsicle and principals at Sky Ridge and it was an amazing outturn. Oh, the kids were so excited. The drawings were adorable. Um, it was actually really neat because Sky Ridge PTC was there um, handing out the supply packs that they had planned and organized through first day school supplies. It was a phenomenal program. Basically, all you do is you go on the website, you get the grade, you click that you want that school supply package, and you could even donate some. So that was really neat right there. Um, I really hope that we get all the other schools um, excited about it for next year. I think it would be really neat to have just a uniform. Um, what else I thought was really neat about the website was that you could actually personalize t-shirts, um, lunchboxes, backpacks. You could put your kid's name on there. You could put the school name on there. It was phenomenal. I can't wait. Also, I wanted to do a shout out to Placer County Sheriff's Office. They actually got together with some students over at, I believe, Auburn Elementary. Um, and with the help of Public Schools Athletic League, they were actually able to get school supplies for some of those kids over there. Um, I think that's phenomenal. I would love to be able to get together with the Placer County Sheriff's Office and get together with the Public Schools Athletic League and get all of the schools, get all of the um, the whole group excited about all of the students in all of our district because it's it's a team effort and we're coming together as a community and I think that's a really great way to show it. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, moving on to the consent agenda, uh, excuse me, consent agenda. What would you like to pull? 
Uh, briefly, I'd like to pull A, um, F, I think F3 would be adequate, and F8, please. Um, this oh. is Trusty Ross. And F8, yes. Yeah. I, I have a question for F2. Okay, so less uh, 9A, F3, F2, and F8. Pardon me for getting those out of order. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move that we approve the consent agenda with um, um, while pulling the items that President Holt identified. Sure. I'll second that. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? That's saying none, that carries. So item 9A. Um, just quickly, I, I had sent this question in advance, but I was, well, there's so many questions about the warrant report really, because we have some really big line items, but one is, the Sodexo consulting fees tend to vary quite a bit. Um, most months they seem like they're about um, nine thousand a month, but the back in April it was about twenty nine thousand a month, and so I was just trying to understand the variance. I tried to give a heads up in advance. Oh, okay. Um, so I have to get back into the microphone routine. Um, CBO Leslie um, on the microphone. And um, so the, with the Sodexo, I looked into that and talked to Child Nutrition. And what it is, is the majority of the bill is really just how much food we're ordering at that point. So they have a flat service fee monthly of about $5,000. And the rest of it is just volume of food or types of food. So some months they order in more so from Sodexo and maybe less from other places, depending on what's available, or more so from other ones, or we have a very large as we were restocking and then maybe utilize that throughout the rest of the year. So that's really the ebb and the flow of them. Okay. Thank you. So, so I remember that we are paying a fee to Sodexo with the promise of having better negotiated rates for the food that we purchase. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So the, thank you for clarifying that the five is just the, what we pay to have access to those the service fee. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Are you, do you think overall it's, um, it's been beneficial? I think it's been, um, I think it has. And I think it, it was a little bit um, murky uh, for our new manager of child nutrition for a little while. And then we actually received a rebate check, um, which she was like, oh, <laughs> that 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 helps things a lot. Um, and it's just getting the, through that full year first of like, you know, this is how we order. And then now that we're in, in more of a groove and we have a better understanding of their ordering systems and um, have done a couple more trainings, I think it's going to be a lot better to tailor some of the menus for the next coming year and things like that. So we can take full advantage of it. But so far it's paid for itself. So that's great. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll, I'll move that we approve um, item 9A. And this is President Holt. I will second that. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. All right. And then uh, Trustee Ross, let's go to you with item F2. Um, so <clears throat> this was the previous board. We had had a discussion. I'm not sure how long ago it was um, about the needs of our media and the possibility of, of not utilizing this anymore. Um, and so I was just curious as far as if we can see a marketing plan, if we could see like the impact that this has had on our, on our district, is it really improving our, what they call it? Um, is, is it really improving our spotlight? Like, is it really making us look better? What, what is it that they're doing? So I don't know if this is maybe for the request, but we had brought this up before. I actually looked through old minutes and I couldn't pinpoint when it was brought up, but I, I remember some prior conversations where we were, and, and I don't remember what which board composition it was, but um, I, I think just in light of budget concerns and having to be so, um, and having to cut so much more out of the budget, um, it puts us in a difficult position of having to reassess everything that we do. Yeah. Um, if. 
if I may explain, um, the funding for this comes from um, our LCAP, and it's part of family engagement. We want to make sure that we can, this is Superintendent Lucha Garcia, um, we want to make sure that we are engaging with families in every way possible. And so we know that um, the biggest way is through the sites, because families want to know what's going on at the sites, um, which is why we often push district messages through principal newsletters, but that doesn't always reach all of the population. So we want to make sure that we have somebody who is talented in knowing um, the, the appropriate use of language that will reach all, all community members and then that, um, that ability to package things and help us get them out to all people. And so the thought um, during the LCAP committee meetings was to continue reaching out to the community um, as much as we can. So, I mean, this is something that we absolutely can address and I will, um, I mean, we address every item anyway in LCAP meetings, but I can definitely bring this back up at, as, a, um, as a concern and we can look at metrics, but we do fund this using supplemental concentration. We have to, we have to make sure that we are engaging with families and that is, that is really important when you take um, any kind of federal and state funding as well as it's important to um, to me and my staff anyway, right? And so um, so we have to be able to show that we are doing everything we possibly can to reach every single community member, parent, especially families, right? Um, and so this was one way we didn't wanna get this up. So what we've done is we've shifted a little bit what, um, what this organization does, what Angie does for us. Um, we brought, we, so she used to do the, the website. We don't, she's not doing that anymore. So we decided to pull that in house and just have her focus on the community engagement and then fund it through that source. So is that like um, social media plus these letters that y'all are writing together that are going out through the school. So it's not just one thing. It's a, it's not just one thing. And in fact, she, um, she and I talked a lot about, um, making sure that we're reaching out to local media and that we're sending positive stories. I know that Auburn used to do that with her. And so we had a, a really big conversation because I want to make sure the work we're doing is meaningful and impactful. I don't, I'm, I've taken on more, um, responsibilities. And so to do my job efficiently, I'm, I'm utilizing, um, the help that we already have, you know, that the consultants and the staff members, um, in ways that is the most efficient in my mind, but also that reaches as many people as we can. That's our goal. Is, is there a marketing plan that they give you for the year and say, this is the strategy we want to use? Is that something we could look at and um, her, what she gave me is attached to the agenda. So, um, if you want more than that and, and the board is interested in, um, drilling down, I did put some of it in my priorities to you when I emailed them to you in July, I did outline, um, my plan with Angie. This was my idea of, of the plan. I'm, you know, as you look at my priorities and we have that conversation, if there's more that you want, we can talk about it within my priorities as well. I or think we're all on board with the concept of wanting to engage families. Um, this is Sarah yep. Brickler. So I, I don't think that that's the, the question. I think it's maybe about, you know, what's the most efficient way, most meaningful way to, to, um, reach families. Absolutely. And, and I, and I thought about that a lot yeah. and, and, but again, you know, working within the LCAP committee as well, um, just to make sure, you know, I, I don't know all the ways that people need their information. I mean, you know, just even in my family, we all need information different ways. And so, I mean, being, you know, the teacher in me knows how to engage learners, right? But but we're talking about community members and people that live here or might not live here, have a business here, might not, you know, have children or schools or not. And so really just trying to, um, to engage as many people as we can. Um, but again, mainly our families are engaged through their principal and their, and their, and their teachers and their school site. And that's why some of what we do goes through principals, but some of it goes out to community as well, just to try to get as many people involved. I would ask that communication that comes from the board um, not go through that filter of um, of this this provider. And that we had a board message over the summer that that um, you know was significantly edited and changed, and um, that that I it would, be, it would be my preference that we could have our own voice rather than have that sort of filter. Can we expect that? Thank you. So, um, is it okay to ask another question? Um, 
So I think like, I, I hear what you're saying, Michelle, and I think it's really, really valuable that our families within this district know what's going on. That's really important to me. Um, I'm also looking at how do families that are not in this district get more information to become a part of this district. So including events, um, I really like to see us at more events. And I don't know if that's something she does, but there's just so much stuff going on for kids and families that I'm not seeing AUSD at. And so that's why I am kind of looking through this. It's very bland. And so I just wish I could see a little more of action and active. What are we doing? With that being, oh, my last question was how long is the contract? Is it for the it's whole one, year or is one, it year. one month? And what happens if we wanted to break this contract or may maybe even look into other marketing solutions? Is that a possibility? I'd have to research that and get back to you. Okay. Thank you. And that's this present hold again. Um, I just didn't see your recommendation, but I think I understand your position on it now. So uh, I would move to approve uh, item F2. I move to second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Nay. All right. So I see Clerk Brickler in the nay? Yes. All right. Okay. And moving to item 9F3. Thank you. This is Clerk um, Brickler. And I wanted to just understand um, in F3 and F4, we had two different situations where we have portable buildings that Auburn Recreation District has um, owned or utilized. And we, I see that we took two different approaches with the, the portables. In one case, we... Um, extended a facilities use agreement and then the other case we are purchasing the portable building from them so i i was just hoping to have a better understanding of um the strategy are we are we hoping to purchase the second building at some point um and <laughs> trying to understand um the age of these portables and and how the pricing was determined um thank you so um cbo leslie um essentially when we first started coming to the discussion of, you know, how we would utilize space, um, the original thought was we were concerned that we wouldn't have room for any after school program to have a room on campus. So those discussions began with ARD. And once it became clear that we were going to be utilizing two different programs um, and we were going to have at least two rooms of space, um, I had to enter into the discussions with um, the Auburn Recreation District of how can we get access to that other building? Um, will you lease it to us? Will you rent it to us? Do we need to buy it from you? Um, their board's decision was their preferred route and actually mine as well. It would be a purchase of the building itself. So so that was in case we needed to put another service provider into a space that ARD owned? Correct. Okay, thank you. Because they own they owned the two up yeah. front. And because we wanted to place Boys and Girls Club there, um, we wanted to make at least one so that we would have one room for each of them at least to move forward. So we began the discussion back and forth of how we would utilize that. And so it, it became a, it would probably be better off if it was purchased. Their desire was not to sell the other one at this time. Um, so I think because in the future- still operating, I'm sorry to interrupt. To, yeah. They're still operating a program out of that portable, so they want to continue to own it. Correct. Okay. And, and I mean, the discussion was had of, I mean, obviously, I think in the past, there was probably a theory that it was better if, if they owned it, but it, it does make things difficult if we have changes in types of program or closures of school sites or changes um, when they own the building that's yeah. sitting on our property. So um, it makes more sense for a school district to own the buildings that are on their property. Um, and then as far as pricing, um, they went through a review, and I'm not exactly sure of the age right off the cuff. It might be within the contract, and I don't have that pulled up right the second I just remember that down. it was in the range of forty thousand dollars so low yeah I think it was like 40 44 000. yeah it was about forty four thousand yeah. dollars and and I mean if you look at pricing for portables that's actually pretty good and um they've if you redone were to go out and purchase a brand new one you yeah know? absolutely yeah. but I mean even in used ones in, in that effort and plus they've completely um redone the biggest driver for them is they had just redone um, the heating and air conditioning system in there. And they just went through and replaced all the floors. So they really were trying to more so look at 
what have we invested in this portable so that we can get that back? And so that was really, I think their biggest driving okay. piece for that pricing. So you feel comfortable with the price that we were able to purchase it for and that and yeah. it came out of um, restricted funds, facilities yes. funds. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You're um, if there are no other questions, I'll move that we approve item F3, nine F3. <laughs> Ms. President Holt, I will second that. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. And then to item 9F8. Uh, this is uh, Sarah Brickler again. And um, I'm excited to learn more about the Go Kid program. I saw that Plaster High School, um, their school district is utilizing Go Kid. It's a um, um, essentially an app that has some protections in place for families to collaborate and to plan carpools um, as another transportation solution. Um, I, I had no idea when I asked about it earlier what the cost would be, and it's a little bit, like everything, it's a little bit higher than I would hope, but um, I guess I, I, I just wanted a little bit more information about um, what our plan is now that we've made this purchase of GoKids software to implement it and how to try to promote utilization of the tool among our families. This is interim superintendent Lucci Garcia. Um, so we are in um, entering into an agreement with them. They are going to do all of the, the, um, the software and all of that organization on their end. We're just going to, um, you know, give them information that they need. Uh, families can sign up if they choose to, they don't have to. Um, oh, yeah. and certainly it's optional. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it is, and it is, um, another option, another way to connect families with, um, a way to get kids to school. Um, and yes, Plaster is using it, not just Plaster, but other districts as well, um, that we've seen. So, uh, the cost is coming out of supplemental concentration dollars. So, um, that is something we worked into that transportation. Um, you know, it's part of transportation. So we worked that into that transportation funding. Um, and we're looking forward to piloting. So this is a pilot. And we're going to see how it goes. If we have two people sign up, is it worth the cost? You know, we'll do that cost analysis, you know. So, um, you know, as with anything that we do brand new. We typically try, I'm not going to say everything. We typically try to pilot first to make sure that it's a good fit for our district. So that's what we're doing with this program. Um, so what makes it a, a pilot in your eyes that it's a one-year agreement for us to kind of test Correct. before we enter into a longer term agreement? Absolutely. I would not want to enter into a longer term agreement in the area of transportation because while we hear that there is, is a lot of need, we don't always get the responses that we think we're going to get. And I wouldn't want to commit large amounts of money to something that we, that we don't need. So absolutely. We're going to monitor this, you know, watch the data, see how, how well received it is. Um, I, I know that they are starting in our elementary schools, but they're still working on um, getting up and running for um, for UB Kane. So that will be to come, but we are in the agreement with them that when that's up and running, we will be able to offer that to our middle school, middle school as well. When will it be offered, pardon me, to, to families? When, or when, I know we're, we have the agreement before us tonight, but Yes, we have the agreement for you and we are working on the logistics. I think Heather probably has some information on that, but as soon as we possibly can, I have a message ready to go out to families. Um, thank you, uh, CBO Leslie again. So yes, actually tomorrow morning, I'm having an onboarding meeting um, with them. And so I should be able to get a lot more information of when they're looking at actually starting to push this out, but it sounds pretty promising. Uh, I think they were hoping to get it going before the end of the month. And I think it just you know, trying to make sure that we ratify the contract and they have the appropriate information and we have the onboarding. So I'd say we'd be online, you know, starting to work that stuff out no later than the end of September. So this is President Holt. Um, I'm just trying to skim through the contract again because I didn't make note of it. Um, but have we run this past our legal and our insurance too? Um, would we be liable um, for anything happening to students uh, who take part in this? When well, anything through legal is very important to us as we don't want to misstep. So we absolutely did. Great. And um, would we be liable, um, you know, once those kids get into a vehicle through this program that we are contracting with, um, are they our responsibility at that moment? I'm going to say we are not responsible, but I'm going to look at Heather for the nod. Okay. And then also, I believe we ran it through SIG as well our school's insurance group. So okay. legal and SIG. So we're, we want to really make sure because, you know, to your point, I mean, it's transportation, right? And so we want to be really careful and, um, and choose, um, 
people that serve our students or companies that serve our students well. So. And this is a uh, vice president wedge. Um, is this an app based program? Um, yes, it is app based, but people that don't have a phone that take apps can still access it through a computer. Correct. Okay. And we'll know more about that tomorrow on that, that onboarding meeting. Yeah, but it's it should be website based or app based. Okay. Um, to President Holtz, uh, what he said, aren't we actually liable for the students from the time they leave their door to the time they arrive at school? Was that not something? I thought that was an ed code that we're reliable for students. I'm only looking to you because you're a teacher in AUTA, so you know this. Um, I think at one point in, in it was that was always my understanding that it. From the time that they left their house to the time that they got to school property and then in reverse but i but but in in terms of the transportation that's being worked out that through this app and this service we have received legal opinion okay. that this is safe for us to utilize yep. uh, maybe part of what we're asking for is it would be helpful to be um informed about what the protections are that are in place or I think there's some kind of a screening process, or I, I don't know what, how, um, you know, what sort of vetting might be in place. Um, this is CBO Leslie. Do you mean for the app itself? Um, I mean for like for people that sign up to do people, carpool. Like, let's say that I signed up to be a driver and I was picking up other people's children. You know, how is um what protections does that app provider are they strictly um connecting there yeah there there is no protections and it because it's not a um school district provided service mm -hmm. in, in that in that legal opinion um which is also the legal opinion and the insurance opinion that the plaster union high school district got um it, it really just serves as like we're just putting it out there of like you guys can totally do that. It, it's kind of like, um, like with the passes for um, city and county transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're actually just providing the monetary value for the pass. Everything else is really um, through the transportation provider and and with the parents. I, I thought, for example, I thought when I looked into it before that there was something where maybe you had to verify who you were before. Oh, you they might, yeah. The app or there, yeah. So maybe after the onboarding meeting, yeah, maybe they'll take tomorrow. me through like a. You could like just a test. A demo, yeah. provide us, yeah, with a little bit more information about okay. <laughs> about um, yeah, how they've designed this. Or it almost just sounds like it's more like a marketplace kind of link. Basically. Yeah. To connect. I have to pick up my kids on this day. Does anybody else need a ride? Mm -hmm. I just use Facebook. <laughs> right. Chit chat. Yeah, I'd be kind of curious on the onboarding, how it goes, what kind of safety protocols are put in place, because, I mean, what's to say that somebody that doesn't have children that has, you know, alternative motives to sign up to the app and. Uh, well, hopefully there's the link to the, at least the schools or something. Yeah. I actually yeah. think there's something I thought that me, I thought I was reading in the contract that the schools have to upload a list of mm -hmm. families, perhaps. Oh, that, good. Yes. That, so that there's like essentially a database of, you know individuals who have students and so i think the invitation only goes out to families it's not like for, right you know, right right, right. Sign up <laughs> yeah so <laughs> anyway i know we're floundering here a little bit it would be so, so helpful to get more information about okay about how this is structured for safety you got it thank you thanks and uh this is president holt again i guess my only other question on it is just uh, how are we how do you intend to measure effectiveness um, do we have a number yet that, yes, this is a su successful program if so many people use it? Um, have we identified that target yet? So in in my mind, does the program pay for itself? That's typically what we look at. However, in the situation where we're just trying to reach all families in all a variety of ways, because to your point, Trustee Rossum may use Facebook and connect with people that way, or they may email each other, or like we do with my daughter's school, you know, work, work things out with the band parents or whatever, you know, there are multiple ways. But again, going back to reaching all, Right. And so if this if, you know, we are using um, restricted funds to pay for this, if the cost is worth, you know, the if 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 the service is worth the cost, that's effective to me. Um, so we'll have to, you know, I, I say that now and and I would love for enough people to sign up to that. It would be, um, you know, that we would cover the cost of this like, oh, this is a hit. If three, five people sign up, you know, 
again, it's hard to say that we wouldn't um, consider that to be effective because those certified people might really count on it, but I would consider that not to be effective. So um, now, I'll, I'll, I'll know more when we have more data, I'll bring the data so you can see it. So uh, on that, um, do we plan on providing this information to parents at back to school nights? No, because we're not ready um, to send okay. this out yet. I do have um, a message to send out, um, but it's I'm not ready to send that until we get all of that. So, for instance, if Heather goes to the demo and there's something alerting, you know, do you see what I'm saying? So we haven't um, closed this deal yet, but it's something that we would like to and that we know that surrounding districts are using and it's beneficial to some families, but we don't want to message it until we know we can provide it. I think we can all agree that um, traffic concerns are, are pretty significant in all the school sites. Um, and so if there's a way to have fewer cars on the road and have some more coordination, I think it would be very beneficial. <clears throat> Agreed. All that being said, do we have a motion? I, I will move that we approve item um, 9F8. All right, I'll second that. And all in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Moving to item 10A, award of bid and approval of contract with sound and signal. This is interim superintendent Lucha Garcia. The ITES department engaged in a proposal process for the replacement and repair of our school site clocks, bells, and PA systems for all of our sites. And that resulted in one bid being received, and that was for a sound and signal for a total of $153,535. This is a capital improvement and will be funded utilizing restricted funding. Administration recommends approval of this contract. I had a clarifying question. This is Clerk Brickler. Um, I, I reviewed the documents that were provided and I found the scope of work to see, to read in a really limited fashion. I, I I read that it's PA system, bells, clocks at the three sites. But beyond that, I was I was expecting that there might be more detail. And I don't know what I would expect. Perhaps that there were 50 <laughs> clocks or there were um, PA systems in 75 locations. Or to, I was just trying to wrap my mind around um, how much work we we we've asked them to complete so i was i may have missed it cuz the the documents are really um they're high volume but i it seemed like it was kind of more standard contract language about work orders and and kind of the the, the flow of the work but i was if anyone could help me understand or point me to where there is more information on the scope of work so from 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 the the high level, I can tell you that we need to overhaul all the all of the systems at the schools, um, and then but then that drill down detailed work, I would have to look to CBO Leslie or um, Director Peters to give you more of that scope of work. Do you have a microphone? Here, here. Got him. Thank you, Director Peters. <laughs> It doesn't really specify the number of clocks because they're going to utilize as much working equipment that they can. Mm -hmm. um, what we're going to get benefit here is basically the main infrastructure <laughs> that uh, our war did not work. Uh, that's, uh, but the back, the back end infrastructure uh, will be replaced. Most of it. So we don't know exactly what they will need to replace it. It's a heavy um, emphasis on the infrastructure, the wiring itself, and then um, the parts that are more visible inside of a classroom. We'll have to see what what needs replacement. Okay, must have been difficult for them to arrive at a price, given that there's so many unknowns with what yeah, sort of equipment. Signal has been a service provider for a long time, so they know our campus okay. very well, and they've worked on this for a long time. I, I can say um, how excited I am to see this work done, because I've been staring at that huge clock outside of Evie Kane that's been stuck um, for <laughs> years, and uh, I'm, so I'm really that's excited. That's not included as part of <laughs> It's that's, not included? No, that's a different <laughs> Wondering. Are these digital clocks or analog clocks? Like people still read clocks in the classroom? 
That's so cool. <laughs> Is it second grade when you teach the, yeah, great cursive writing too. Okay, just thank you. No, vice so president. Wave. What would it What would it take to include the Evie King uh, clock on the outside? <laughs> so the, the clock, that mural. My my experience with those clocks is the clock that's at uh, Auburn Elementary. Um, uh, we have control panel where it is because of daylight savings time is always off. And so we did find that, and there is another company uh, that does work I think it's uh, more than like to just um, work on that before. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Director Reports, before you go, I think Vice President Wedge may have had a question. Yeah. Do you still have a question? Yeah, quick question. Um, now, uh, you mentioned as far as all the infrastructure, as far as underground conduits, has been there for 30 years. Has those been verified that they're actually still usable? And if not, um, are we going to see, uh, is there change orders in this clause? I, so the, are you talking, uh, is the conduit usable? Correct, like so all the raceways and pathways. I believe the conduit is usable. The wire that they ran through those conduits years ago has, has uh, deteriorated because water has got into those conduits. Um, I'm not an expert in that area, so I'm trusting in there. Um, to, you know, and, and I believe that they had something to do with installing a lot of it in the, in the day. Okay. Well, my only concern is that, um, you know, I didn't read through all the contract. Is there something in there where they're actually going to, you know, you know, to, uh, you know, clerk uh, Brickler's uh, point, um, they came up with this number. So do they have something in the contract as it is, you know, that they're guaranteeing they can get, you know, their conductors through those raceways? That I, I don't know. I asked that contract on the uh, because my concern here is that they get out there and do the jobs like, uh oh, this ain't going to work. Now we got to rip up sidewalks and saw cut. And we need another hundred thousand dollars. And you know, that's um sorry, CBO Leslie. I mean, that's always a fear unless you do a lease lease back contract, um, where you have, you know, a maximum. But uh the one thing in, in dealing with sound and signal, they had actually come out and done a proposal um previous to this. Um, it just they they were already proposing to do the work previously and um Director Peters was trying to price out um, different people. And that so they were the price that came in and he'd had a couple other prices. But um, when it kind of came to me, I realized, oh man, this is over the bid limit. So that's kind of why it already, it went back out. So what they did is they actually took it, they repriced it based on current, and then also that they were gonna be having to um, report to Department of Industrial Relations. So their figure changed a little bit on it. So they've already kind of looked at it and priced it a couple of times. So, and I feel pretty comfortable um, with sound and signal, and I don't think they would want to be one stuck in a like a hundred thousand dollar change order if we ended up with that. Okay. Are there any other additional questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? This is uh, Vice President Wedge. I will go ahead and make a motion to approve a ten A. Sarah Brickler, I will um, second. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? All right. Seeing none, the motion carries. And moving to item 10B, approval of the 23-24 budget revision. Per Ed Code, um, not later than 45 days after the governor signs the annual budget act, the district shall make available for public review any revisions and revenues and expenditures that it has made to its budget to reflect the funding made available by that budget act. Sibia Leslie is going to present this information to you today. Push the button. The volume's not ready. Right. Here we go. 
Thank you. Uh, President Holt, Interim Superintendent Lucci Garcia, members of the board. Um, this evening, you're seeing what I like to call a hybrid version. So sometimes you would see a 45-day revision after the original budget adoption, and that's kind of what we were geared to. What you're seeing tonight is actually at, we're requesting that you readopt a portion of the budget um, from the County Office of Education, because as we worked through the tediousness of the audit adjustments that we had to work, originally as we formed the budget and with our fiscal expert, Dennis Snelling, um, it was uh, stated that we should only put some of them in prior year and then just make sure that they were noted in our current year budget, which is what came to you originally. After that budget was adopted, they came back and said, nope, actually, if you could go ahead and adjust those in last year's numbers. So what that did was change our starting balances for our estimated actuals that are part of the budget package. And because of that, they are requiring that you do uh, another approval essentially of those numbers. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of what's changed, what's new and some budget items. So again, kind of talked about like, what are some of these revisions that we're looking at? Um, as we had talked about before, um, they were looking at reductions to our learning uh, recovery block grant and the arts and music instructional materials block grant. They did go forward with that, but not as deep of cuts as they had originally anticipated. So right now for the arts and music um, instructional block grant, we're looking at about a three, three and a half percent reduction that we're having to hold aside in the budget. And then for the learning recovery block grant, we're looking at about five to six percent in reductions. So that's good news. Um, Again, as we talked about um, our estimated actuals, you're going to see um, changes in the original starting balances from 22, 23. So it's not gonna be the 23, 24 starting balances. You're gonna to have to like place yourself a whole year back. And then as part of those audit adjustments, we had to change our um, uh, average daily attendance for the 22, 23 years. So those also went into effect in the local control funding formula calculator. So that also altered a little bit how that funding looked. Your guys' favorite slides, I know. So in your packet and on there, you'll see changes since the adopted. So what I actually did, since this is still just like a re-adoption or a 45, this will give you an idea of the original adopted budget that we had in June, um, what has been revised, and then what the differences are over here. And as you can see, the biggest chunks really end up being two ending balances and beginning balances right here. And those are because of those audit adjustments. Now, in addition, there are a couple of other little pieces that have come in here, and some of those were um, this, and I think it's on the next slide, um, will you see some changes here to um, explanations on them, but this $45,000 really had to do with the reduction of the LCFF income that we were seeing. The $125,000 was because we added an additional budget line for substitutes, because as we, as we had to do this, we basically had to get a new click capture in time. So we already had some payments that had gone through, we'd already made some changes to the budget, and we had to recapture that snapshot and reload it into the um, SACS website that the state requires. So there's a couple little of adjustments in there. So again, there's slide two with your changes explanations. And so again, as we as we look at this a little bit differently, and as we already have some of these adjustments that have taken place to beginning balances, this alters a little bit where you saw that deficit spending and where we saw our budget. So without any reductions in, in the hopper, um, except for, for this fiscal year, but in looking at future years out, it's still really important to note that even though we're making those positives, we still have that big deficit spent. So um, as I know that we gave everybody heartburn previously in the, in the third out year, we were at about $92,000. Um, as this budget sits, we're at about $41,000 with a deficit spend of $485,000. So this See, is the three-year multi-year projection that you're showing right here. That was in, that was in the packet. So um, essentially what this means is as we roll into next year, if nothing changes, we would be negative uh, approximately $500,000 to $600,000. So identified budget reductions. One of the other things that you saw on your multi-year was a line that was coded like an orangey pink color. And that is where we have identified budget reductions. Now, something similar came to the board when we were looking at the fiscal recovery plan when we first started the budget committee. 
And that was uh, advice that we had gotten that if we were trying to, you know, certify as anything besides negative, we need to call out some reductions. We did that and Placer County Office of Education rightfully requested that we go ahead and, you know, line those out a little bit more and then take a board action on them. Um, in working with Placer County Office of Education with these adjustments, and everything else that we've adjusted to the budget since then, their recommendation was that we go ahead and also identify some reductions. Um, they said, you know, put them in, you know, just place them in essentially. And I was like, mm, you know, I didn't really like that. So we went through and we really did line out for you guys the reductions. So we'll have a list of them um, coming up here pretty soon, but it's in vacancies. But if you can see, we've already identified for 24, 25 and 25, 26 ongoing budget reductions of $786,000, almost $787,000. So the reason why they come out this way, instead of being zero on 25, 26 is because I had to loop them in. They don't carry forward. So I have to add them in both years. And again, it's tiny, but I try with this slides. Um, the budget reductions that we've already identified are actually vacancies that we had had budgeted um, that we're just carrying forward in the budget that either we hadn't hired in quite some time or we do not intend to continue with that program. Uh, these aren't layoffs, so these aren't ones that we have to go through a layoff process. There's currently no one in those positions. Um, they're just ones that we've been carrying in the budget and really going through with that real fine tooth comb, identifying those and uh, or ones that we missed when we altered some of the way that we structured the curriculum and the scheduling for the middle school. So instead of having many multiple subject credential teachers, we have a lot of single subject and we had a couple multi-subject teachers that they still had vacancies on there. Um, in addition to this, we also have the elimination of the assistant superintendent of educational services and the benefits that correspond with that. So one of the things I want to bring up is um, moving the reductions to first interim. So uh, originally, as we worked through this budget, because we identified these in, in this budget year, or I should say just in this last month, uh, we were looking at incorporating those savings into this fiscal year and showing that on the multi-year projections. Um, at request of Placer County Office of Education, um, they asked that we removed those reductions from this fiscal year. Um, and their reasoning being is if we had already identified them, we should actually just go all the way back and include them in the budget and then redo a whole budget. But you know, time is of the essence as we have a board meeting coming up and meeting timelines. So what we did is at the request is we removed those from this fiscal year and what we're kind of knowing is that we're going to go ahead and enact them anyways. In fact, we've already moved for, you know, closing some of those positions and closing some of those vacancies. So in first interim, you're going to see a, a little bit of a different picture because we're going to be wrapping those savings into first interim. The difference that that makes, and it is pretty impactful, is that we're going to capture those year of savings, which means that we're going to show even greater savings as we go out because we won't have expended those things within this fiscal year. So essentially, then we're taking that $786,000 and, and saving it as a reduction in this fiscal year, and then that savings rolls, and then that savings rolls. So it ends up with, with a better picture. It's just we're not really able to show it. In, in this particular one, but this is something that you'll see captured in first interim. Pardon me, remind yes. me again why we have to wait until first interim at the request of the County Office of Education, we couldn't have included that in this um, 45 day revision? Um, we could have, but we would have had to go back through and redo the budget completely instead of just changing the starting balances on the estimated actuals. We would have had to go back through and rework and close it out and go through all the budget documentation. So it would have been a, a really large undertaking. And so their request is that we just remove it. And we didn't have a really a good way inside the reporting system um, that the state requires of us to kind of note, hey, we're gonna take these out. So we would have had to completely redo the budget. So what they've asked is that we just go ahead and just cut it from there. They said, you're still positive, it's good. Capture those on first interim and then okay. we'll see where you're at. We'll see them in December. Exactly. Okay. Oh, I should add, you know, for a note here, and as I'm sure you guys are aware, is that even though we we have identified this, which is fantastic, um, we're still going to be in a deficit spending, you know, situation. So we still need to continue to identify further cuts. So a couple other things that I wanted to touch on besides just that piece. Um, so as we work through some of these things, and as I uh, have attended a couple of budget workshops and a few of the other things as we piece through these, one of the things that came up is, um, you know, the CEA minimum, and this is something that gets discussed pretty regularly, but 
you know, getting new information um, to me, I always want to make sure I share it with you guys. So you have the same perspectives that I do as much as possible. So what this usually is, is current expense education formula. So they consider it classroom expenses to um, to classroom or certificated teacher expenses, essentially. And for elementary districts, you you need to try and keep it at 60 percent. Um, right now, we're at 51 percent of teacher salaries to classroom expenditures. And so our difference is about 8.80%. And this has become really tough and, and we've had, you know, waiver situations and everything else, just like everybody else in the county and the state. And really it's, the problem becomes is because we pull from unrestricted and restricted. So that means all those COVID money that we got in there were just one time, the learning recovery block grant, that's just, you know, one time, the arts and music, that's one time. Um, those get counted towards us because those are expenditures that we're making. However, in being good stewards of money, as we saw in the FICPAT report, you know, is one of the things that they ask, are you using one-time money to fund ongoing expenses? And we were able to actually mark no on that um, because we try to keep one-time money to one-time expenses. So that skews it off. And so just to give you a picture of what that looks like for everybody else is this gives you an idea of statewide how many districts are not meeting that same requirement because of the same issue. So you can see that right now for 21-22, even in the past, over half of our school districts and even more so now uh, throughout the state of California aren't able to meet that same requirement because of the influx of one-time monies. Uh, uh, Clerk yeah. Brickler, may I ask, what are the implications of um, not meeting that 60% threshold? Um, you had mentioned that there's a waiver opportunity because I, I know sometimes we can be fined if we're out of compliance with a percentage like that. Right. So uh, the verbiage um, for educational code is that um, we are to make up those expenses in, in a future year. Um, the waiver policy really does go into place for a lot of this, and those get signed off by the County Office of Education typically as to, you know, they understand that there's been a different situation or extenuating circumstance, and we apply for the waiver on it so that we don't have to kind of make those up in future years. And unfortunately, the state is just in a really odd position that they're having a huge influx of that type of stuff right now. So I would just kind of keep that in the back of your minds. I have a feeling that there might be some different legislation that's going to come up around that. But no fines are expected or anticipated. Okay. No. Ah, there we go. So we did have a cost of living increase. So, you know, we had our, our 8.22 cost of living increase. And this is where I like to show the picture of um, what that really means to us. Um, so you can see that we have our, our last year and current year, what we're anticipating for funded um, average daily attendance. So not necessarily what our ADA actually is, but now that they have that three-year rolling average, this is what we're supposed to be funded at. So last year we were funded at 1513. This year we anticipate we'll be funded at 1402. Um, this is what our, and you know, our entitlement is, you know, per average daily attendance. This is what our total funds end up being from LCFF funding. So you can see in 22-23, obviously we're having a reduction, you know, of over 100 in ADA. And so even though the entitlement has gone up with cost of living, we're actually receiving less in LCFF funding than we would have previously. So we have um, an amount decrease, which is about, you know, a 0.04% decrease in funding. So that's our percentage. Usually, I think last time we saw this, we it was like 13%, but our percentage was only like six or something like that. I'm, I'm just going off of quick memory. Um, so our percentage cost of living increase is actually a negative number. Um, and so just everyone's aware that what's on the horizon, because it's going to come up, the minimum wage is still on the move. Um, January 1st, 2024, it will go up to $16 an hour from $15.50. Um, with our current uh, salary schedules, this will not impact us at this point. However, when we come into 2025, which is I start budgeting, getting a little bit deeper into budgeting as we go forward, um, that's where we're going to see um, that come into play with our classified salary schedule again, where we're going to need to make some adjustments on that. Um, and I've also noted that it's going to continue to increase until 2029. They've got it docked out for $18.30 an hour. Uh, just because I really liked this and I know that everybody's kind of in a state of declining enrollment, I just wanted to give you guys a picture of um, where the declining enrollment projections are and where they see it. And I know these are counties that are a little bit uh, different than us, but you know, as we as we look at those smaller percentages of decrease, which are pretty average right now, um, we can see that there's a lot of other places in the state that are experiencing some pretty heavy decline as well. 
So I had a couple of questions come up about the LCFF equity multiplier, and this is a new concept um, that the state enacted with this budget. And while they were still working on trailer bill language and how they were going to roll it out, it was really kind of unclear. I, I had a feeling that as they were talking, it was something that was not going to be applicable for us. Um, but I was really waiting for a lot of the language to come out before I you know, maybe got my hopes up. Um, what it is looking like, of course, is that we we would not be eligible for this, but I just really wanted to get this uh, visual out there for you guys who had a little bit of understanding in case you heard that, um, what that meant, and what that meant for the districts that um, are eligible. Um, it, and it, it is a little bit um, interesting on how it goes, but as basically we're looking for, um, you know, prior year socially economically disadvantaged at greater than 70%. So our total unduplicated, um, you know, we're right at that 50-ish percentile, 55-ish percentile. So we don't quite make the mark overarchingly even for unduplicated to meet that. Um, and then even once you get that, you still have to have um, a prior non-stability rate. And my understanding of that is really non-stability for um, attendance or enrollment. So if you have like a migrant student or, or things of that nature. Um, so just a, a quick thing also, I mean, I know we talk about like, you know, leasing buildings and moving buildings and things like that. And this is something that had been asked of me previously, you know, what, what does that look like overarchingly in the state or what is the demand for that? And as I found this slide, I just wanted to share it with the board because I also found it interesting that, I mean, you know, while again, these are larger areas, uh, they are predominantly more business centered or, you know, large businesses or lots of different businesses where people would go to that less so. Um, in a more rural area like us. But as you can see, um, and I'm, I'm certain this has a lot to do with the work from home uh, movement that's been happening since COVID, um, but office vacancy rates continue to increase, um, decrease demand for commercial properties. So you can just kind of get an idea statewide as to where that's moving. So again, an update on budgeting and state calendar. Um, as we talked about before, the state's been very concerned about its tax revenues. Um, they continue to be concerned about tax revenues. So uh, next flow coming in in December, um, we'll have first interim coming to you December 15th. Uh, the, in about January is where the state's going to decide whether or not it has a surplus or a, a deficit and what that looks like to us. And then again, in March, you'd have second interim. And then again, it's just my warning of like, you know, if the, st if the state comes in and it's really, really low, I'm still not fully convinced that we wouldn't see deferred revenues, that we that they wouldn't defer out payments to us. So again, budget is still certifying positive, which it was before. Um, we've noted the reductions that we talked about to meet required reserves. Um, it's still deficit spending, and um, we still need to be identifying some further reductions, which I know we've been talking in depth internally about, and we'll be bringing you some suggestions next month as well, so we can start discussing that further. Okay. Any question? Actually, I should probably just take that for myself. This is President Holt. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think, you know, the request I would have is if we could have, obviously, you're going to be making suggestions next month. Could you also give us what does it look like to not be deficit spending? How deep do we have to dig? And what does that look like? What do we have to cut? Um, I mean, what would those really hard calls be to get us at least on keel, on an even keel? Thank you. Uh, this is Clerk, Clerk Brickler. Um, similarly, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, you're trying to look through the budget and trying to figure out where we might be able to make cuts. And I know we're waiting for um, administra administrative um recommendations on that. But one thing I see is when you see that we made $5 million approximately in contributions from unrestricted um, to restricted, is there any, um, let's see, could any part of that be reconsidered or are those all required? I know the probably the big driver of that are special education costs. Um, but I just, you know, when you see such a large um, movement from unrestricted to restricted, it makes you wonder if there might be something that could be withheld from that. Um, thank you. CBO Leslie again. Um, yes, uh, typically, and in this budget, you will see, and, and again, we have unaudited actuals, which I should have added in, which is coming in September. So that'll give you a clearer picture of where we actually landed. I mean, these were just 
estimated actuals that we were pulling from. So I think we're actually going to see a little bit of a decrease in our special education. We've been able to shuffle some monies other places, which is fantastic. Um, we will see a little bit of an increase of what we had to contribute to make accounts even for Alta Vista Community Charter School. Um, but the biggest driver on that with that particular thing is, is special education cost. That is a majority of that is our special education contributions. Um, but the good news is, is um, as we'll talk, I guess if you want to look at it as good news, um, and we could talk about that as we look at the action plan a little bit later. Um, one of the things that was noticed from uh, FICMAT was that, you know, our identification rates for special education were a little high comparatively to statewide. Um, there were some requests for, you know, uh, looking at that a little bit tighter. And uh, today we held our first um, special education kind of budget watch meeting, if you will. Uh, there's only so much control, you know, obviously we're, we need to serve students how they need to be served. Um, and unfortunately, it, the state just doesn't cover the cost for our special education students the way that it should. Um, however, this really became our opportunity to have like regularly um, a little bit more than quarterly check-ins on where we're at with the special education budget. And um, also that's one of the reasons why we engaged in the program specialist um, to really kind of drill in a little bit more and have a, a tighter look at our um, methods and how we're expending money in special education and um, a lot of our IEP processes. Thank you. Because I see that as the seems like one of the main costs that's increased um, over the years that's um, really Huge. hampering our ability to be solvent. Um, I mean, we knew that there were the audit findings and that there would have to be adjustments, but it, it's really hard to see that. Um, it's pretty staggering that, you know, to see this update and see that we, even though we've made some cuts and there's been a lot of um, um, you know, like the school consolidations and things that are happening to be more solvent that we still, you know, have this, we have like $900,000 less this year than, mm -hmm. than we had projected. So, um, yeah, I'm just really concerned as I see, uh, that, you know, that things are not moving, um, in the direction that we need them to. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. sorry, I don't mean to say that there's like no hope, but, you know, um, <laughs> just even some of those smaller line items, um, you know, that was like another $150,000 we weren't expecting that, um, you know, between right. like some of the um, decreases in LCFF revenue and um, increased staffing costs. So um, how does our current enrollment look? I know it's the beginning of the school year, there could still be some movement, but do we have a sense of um, whether enrollment has declined as expected or um, I'm going to pull up actually, and I don't know if you want to speak to that um, interim superintendent, but I'm going to pull up our prior enrollment and then I can I can give you a better gauge on that. That's great. Thank you. Um, this is interim superintendent Lucha Garcia. We did look at enrollment. So we are looking each day to see, you know, so we have those who enrolled and then those who show up. And so far we are down um, at each of our sites. Um, significantly at our elementary, not so significantly at our middle school from what, from the kids that enrolled. Now that doesn't mean they're not going to show up. It just means that, you know, they haven't yet. Right. And so we're watching this daily. We, we will get a better number for you when we um, have had students in school for at least a week. Um, so you'll be hearing uh, more updates from us on enrollment. Um, the biggest component to that would be that we will update you on um, after census day when we have that snapshot and that snapshot on census day is what the state looks at to fund us so that's going to be the big day that's the first i think it's the first wednesday in october um so we will update you um as to what our official enrollment is according to the state thank you I wanted to ask, there was, um, in the, the budget report, there was a comment about using ongoing funds to fund one-time expenses. And I believe that was to fund uh, technology um, replacement and curriculum adoption, both of which are very important. But I'm just wondering for the purpose of balancing our budget and staying solvent, um, I, is that is that an is, is there an opportunity to kind of hold those items back until we have a better understanding of our fiscal position? Uh, thank you, CBO Leslie. And, and just for the enrollment question, I mean, it, and this is really just like off the cuff, but if I went from last year's October enrollment, it looks like um, 
we are right now poised to be maybe like five students up from that. But don't don't get too excited. Yeah, let's wait until the enrollment stuff comes in. But that that'll just give you an idea. So hopefully we won't have um, declined as much as we predicted, which would be great. That would be um, great. Then there would be like a bonus. Um, as far as the curriculum adoption and the technology, um, those are things that, um, especially working with the fiscal expert, that we know we're going to basically have to do. Mm -hmm. So it was requested that we go ahead and assign those out. Um, we know we're going to have to adopt curriculum, whether or not, depending on, and I, I would let you answer that, the, the math requirements. That yeah, we're, we're waiting. So the up. State Board of Education is um, re reworking the framework for math. And so I need to make sure that they vote on that and that they adopt it and that I can um, take a look at the changes before we jump into piloting this year, which is which was the plan. Um, because if there are significant changes, I don't know that our textbook companies would be able to get ahead of that and start, you know, publishing what we need. So we are working with PCOE on that right now and we're watching, keeping an eye on it. So, so that may be delayed. Yeah. So that I was going to say that reservation say that. of funds that's might so pick up from one year and plop to the next. And the same thing with technology replacements. I mean, it really that's, that's based for con continuing our technology for our students as, as it is type of thing of basic replacement. So it, it is one of those things where like, we're, we're going to have to, if, if for any reason we come across any other monies, one-time monies or anything like that, that we can, we can do that. We will obviously divert it to that. I, I, the loose thought that I had was that Perhaps as a one-time expense, that's something that we could seek grants for or find other ways to offset the cost. Because I, I recognize the importance, but um, three years out, we're at such, you know, we have $40,000 in the bank account. So um, as we've seen these, what kind of, how much the budget can fluctuate, we know that's not adequate. So I'm just trying right. to think about what else we can hold on to that um, we could possibly defer or find another source of funding. Absolutely. And I, I think we continue to look at that. So um, I think now that we have some, you know, additional um, information about how many cuts are going to go through the arts, music and instructional grant, I think that's something that we can look at as it, it may not cover, we may not be able to cover all of it um, uh, for future curriculum, but it might be an avenue that we can look at in order to utilize those funds. Okay. And just so that the board knows we are continuously looking at this. I, I mean, this is what we do continuously looking for ways um, to support our students and do it, you know, being fiscally responsible. Are there any additional clarifying questions on this? Then I move that we approve the 23-24 budget revision. I'll second that. Vote by President Webb seconds. And all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. And if it is okay with everybody, and I would, I would actually like to take a five minute recess. Uh, so it is currently. Uh, we're we're going to round up to 818, so we'll be back in at 823.
Okay, it is 8.23. We are back in session. Coming up next on information discussion items, 11A, discussion of grant for appraisal. Clerk Brickler. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is an item that I wanted to bring forward. I um, I really appreciate the work that Placer Community Foundation um, does for um, for Auburn and their, their focus on um, supporting the community and, and also stu our students. And I guess where this conversation originated was um, they have a, a housing task force that is looking for, um, looking to develop affordable housing within our county. And, you know, I saw um, a statement made in the Sacramento Bee about the surplus property held by school districts and, and reached out to them to learn more about the, what I had read. Um, you know, the, the, the Sherland track property um, is not um, like not likely to be developed for affordable housing purposes for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, through these conversations, uh, Placer Community Foundation was aware that we had some surplus property. Um, they've been kind of, as many other community members are kind of tracking where we are with our surplus property and what our plans will be. And, um, you know, the, the appraisals, for example, have been made publicly available and they had the, um, you know, had the opportunity as we did to review the appraisals that were completed for Sherland Tract and also for the Kemper Road properties, which both came in at um, $280,000 each. Um, Sherland Tract is a 47 acre parcel that uh, is in a really desirable part of Auburn that's, um, you know, near uh, like kind of like a, a nice subdivisions and also um, kind of more rural properties where where um, individuals have acreage in addition to their home sites. And so the, you know, I think that the community foundation's interest is in ensuring that if we are in a position where we have surplus property, that we're able to obtain um, the best value for our students when we are to to make it available on the market. And um, the, the appraisal value um, struck the kind of developer and real estate community that is on this committee as, um, as much lower than they would have anticipated. And so in their interest in wanting us to um, move towards fiscal solvency and really kind of get the most value possible out of our asset that then translates into services for students. Um, they have generously offered us a grant in the amount of $5,000, which would cover a second opinion appraisal. And they have worked with an um, MAI, it's the type of specialty appraisal that works in, um, um, you know, kind of publicly held lands that this appraiser who's previously appraised the property was willing to offer his services for $5,000 so that there would be, um, it would be completely cost neutral to the district for us to, if we were to um, accept the grant and um, can have the appraisal conducted. So um, I'm, I'm very grateful. I was really rather surprised that they would be willing to assist us in this way, but very grateful that, um, that they would be willing to help us, um, receive a, a second opinion appraisal that could potentially, um, result in us being able to, uh, bring in a lot more income or I shouldn't say income, but, um, a higher sale price that would benefit our students. So I'll just pause for a moment. Um, and I, I guess what well, the other thing I wanted to comment on is when you look at the appraisal that was conducted, there were some things that were, you know, somewhat surprising to me about it. And again, this is not my my area of expertise, but um some of the comparable um um properties were were not um in as desirable of areas as as South Auburn that's bordering, you know, Granite Bay, essentially. They were in Pilot Hill. They were in kind of more like, um, you know, rural areas that are much farther away from, from um, you know, from cities like Auburn. 
Um, so there was a question about whether or not the comparable properties were an appropriate match for the value of our our particular property. And um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about this, but I see that you know that there's there's might be a comment that there wasn't water available yet on our warrant report we are paying PC, PCWA a water bill for that site so it leads me to believe that there is water available so I I guess I just I question somewhat some of the facts of the initial appraisal and I would really welcome the opportunity to have a another opinion and to see if it comes out as a at a different value point. So let me just pause since I've um, introduced that to see if there's anything administration would like to add um, or if um, trustees have questions. Um, this is Trustee Ross. My question is, is there a deadline on when we need to give them notice if we will accept this grant or not? Is there? I believe the grant period goes through the end of this calendar year. So, um, um Oh, but it is, it does say in the grant letter that the date is flexible and can be changed as needed. Because this is not an action item, correct? This would have to be put on our next agenda as an action item. Is that, or can we decide tonight? You're right. It's just discussion is how it's written, but, um, well, and the board could give me direction to pursue you know, this as well. To accept the grant. because, Or, or to, well, to apply for or meet with or wh yeah. whatever the board decides are the next steps. You could give me direction to to accomplish those next steps. That's, this is President Holt. Uh, as I read it, it looks like they essentially have already awarded the grant to us. It's ours if we want it. Um, that's as I read it. Um, and also, I don't see that we have until December 31st to accept it, but rather that we will get back in writing as to what we use that those funds for by December 31st. So we'd have to definitely be ahead of that schedule. Um, so my question for administration though would be, do you see any unforeseen costs or things that we're not considering or that that we don't see in this letter? Or do you have concerns about accepting this grant? Um, this is Sup Interim Superintendent Luci Garcia. Um, we would definitely run this through our legal department just to make sure that we are you know, in compliance and following all of the, um, the legal qualities qualifications that CBO Leslie could definitely explain better than I am. Um, but yes, we will work with the legal team on this. Could you possibly provide an example of what you, um, what might legal uncover? What is, sure. the, what is the potential concern? Um, so one of the things that, um, that I heard from, you know, from our, our legal team, just in the conversation is that since we've had an appraisal already, um, would having another appraisal, um, cause a conflict or would we have to average the two or um, would there be some other type of um, situation that I'm not masterful in this area. So I'm just going to tell you that, but that was the big concern for me is if we went through this and then, you know, for some reason we couldn't use it because we just had a more recent appraisal or if we, you know, had to average or whatever, that would just be something I'd want to make sure that we're, that we're covered. But CBO Leslie has more detail because when they explain this to her, she understands the terms they use. So she's going to give you more detail on that. Thank you. Um, CBO Leslie, um, uh, interim superintendent, uh, Lucha Garcia is correct. Um, there is some uh, conflict if we've got two, and especially because the other one was made public, um, you know, how, how that would kind of hash out. So we want to make sure that we're, we're drawing that line correctly. Um, it, we want to make sure if this person has used, you know, um, previous information that we're, we're taking fresh new information. Um, and one of the things I think that is key um, that was kind of overlooked before, you know, we were really trying to be, um, uh, you know, a, a little bit more cost savings, a little, the, the, there was more, um, push previously to let's just get these appraisals. Let's just get this stuff done. Um, really when you do an appraisal, one of the best practices that you can do if, if we're looking at that type of situation that it could be kind of threading the needle, do we have to average it is by going through legal, it becomes, um, actually, um, a client, uh, client privileged information. So it, it becomes more of a private, um, thing. So as we start going into negotiations and things like that, um, that's, kind of something where we don't have to make it as public. We can actually keep that as private information, not have to advertise it. And um, then it, that allows legal to work the best deal for us, essentially. I understand that th there are often situations where there are multiple appraisals. So I don't know that, I don't know that that presents a problem from what I understand. And 
I guess I just wonder if one of the terms of the grant might be that we, I think that there would be a desire for the appraisal to be public. I hadn't really heard before that that, that second appraisal, that second opinion might be kept kind of in-house or, or mm. as part of a, a protected attorney-client privilege. And that's our, that's our legal recommendation from our legal firm, actually from a couple of them. So, okay. Do you uh, have any of that in writing? I would love to see what they, um, I can get it for you in writing. Sure. Um, I, yeah, I just, I think if there's something that our legal has advised, it would be so helpful if it could be shared with the board. Well, and, and to be clear, um, legal advisement on this, I mean, we, we needed to see what direction the board is going with this before we actually sit down and put this in front of them and, and sit side by side. But we do to be, to be responsible, um, here, you know, we, we, we do need to make sure that we have the big picture idea of what could be something that we need to consider, right? I also met with with Sue and I and I heard, you know, exactly what the intent is behind the grant. So I I listened to both to both of those things, right? One, to be responsible that we are um that we are being fiscally responsible and and wise, right? And then the other to, to really try to understand the grant and the concept behind it. So um I just want to be really clear about that. Um as far as getting something in writing, we can do that. We wanted to hold off on that until we knew the direction of the board because that's going to come at a cost. And that goes back to what to what I'm saying. Like the, there's, you know, and and why exactly we're taking all grants to the board because we feel that this is it, it's your decision it's your choice we will do the work as the board directs but we just want to make sure that you have this opportunity to talk about it and and weigh the pros and cons and then we will get the work done i guess i was just hearing that there was already a decision that was made and so i was thinking that if you had already gotten direction from legal that that this is president Holt. I, that that's not what i understood i i, I think they from what I've understood from administration, they kind of did a quick pass by legal, but not a thorough vetting of it because that will come at a much higher cost. And so they at least had that five minute conversation that only costs us three hundred dollars, you know, or whatever it is. I'm kidding, but uh, but they will go if we ask them to for a more in depth look and get a better report back from legal. Um, and so I, I I don't see any reason why we wouldn't want to do that at this opportunity or at this juncture. So. Okay. Um, that that's my sense of it is if we you know could move ahead get a recommendation from from legal um and then if you could get that back to us um see if they've identified anything that we need to be aware of or anything that could trip us up absolutely and i saw three nodding so i'm assuming four nodding okay okay um we will do that so i guess i'm just curious about our legal what is so their expertise is in schools this seems like somewhat more of a real estate matter i guess i just don't know we we utilize um legal counsel um within a, their specialty area so um the legal counsel that we are um that we will work with and that we use for these types of of um of items they have a specialty in this area yeah I, I I wouldn't want to use somebody that doesn't give us good advice because like you, I am deeply concerned about being fiscally responsible. So absolutely. Yeah. I think I just have a concern that if we, um, if we rely on the first appraisal, it's so low that even if let's say we um, are able to get double that price and, and we feel like that's a win, we're really setting the bar low for ourselves that, um, that once we sell surplus property, um, it's gone forever. And this is kind of our one opportunity to try to capitalize on an asset and um, make it work the best we can for our students. So I'm very grateful to Plaster Community Foundation for um, proposing, you know, for, you know, offering this generous grant to us to try to, um, you know, get as much um, as we can out of that parcel. Thank you. And this is President Holt again. Okay, moving on to 11B, report of fiscal expert from PCOE. Um, so as part of the letter of going concern, a fiscal expert was assigned to AUSD um, and conducted a series of um, interviews and um, worked with CBO Leslie and her department um, to really dig down into the budget. Um, so this letter is a report of his findings and his recommendations. Okay. 
for this. This is just for discussion. So, so y'all can look at it and have it discussed. And if you have any questions, you can ask Sylvia Leslie. There's no action for this item. It's just more of this is that's for discussion. This is yep. President Holt. Then um, on page six, uh, it talks about um, you know we've been, what we decided earlier this year to hire aides and at a higher rate instead of relying on outside contractors. Um, is that working? Um, did, was that decision effective? Yeah. Um, we are still hiring contractors because it is hard to, um, it continues to be hard to find people who will come and work in that field. However, uh, I believe that we have more staff, more of our own staff this year than we did last year. We just had a meeting on this and we determined that we were, it's by a margin of a few, but still, and we're continuing to hire. Um, we just held interviews today as well. So we're, we're really working on continue to work on that. It is our goal to have all of our own people here and hired and not have to contract out. Thank you. Um, President Holt again, moving to page seven, um, where he cites the one-time savings um, by removing the assistance or not having the assistant superintendent position this year, um, but saying that it would be back in the multi-year projection for 24-25. Is that going to be resolved uh, with the elimination of that position? Okay. Just wanted to. That will be resolved. That there was no intent to bring that position back. I uh, thank you. I just wanted to make sure because mm -hmm. he said it would be coming back, but I thought we were moving away from it. We are. Um, and those were a couple of my top questions. Is anybody else? Anyone else? Um, this is Trusty Ross, and I think one thing that uh, definitely gets me nervous is that it says um, on the first page. Um, the ba uh, balance is projected to decline by more than 2.5 million. Congratulations. That's huge. Um, however, in 2026, 2027, the AUSD general fund will be unable to meet its financial obligations. So do we have plans for this? I mean, what is that? So um, today you heard CBO Leslie tell you that we've already identified, um, I believe it's, it's 780, I'm going to say 787-ish, but $780,000 in, in reductions already. And that was just going through our position control um, and eliminating positions that we know we're not bringing back. And one of those is that assistant superintendent position. Um, so, and, and that's just right now, since, you know, we talked last in June and it's August. And in the meantime, we've done all the other things we've done and we've still identified those. It is extremely important to us to continue to identify um, cuts to make. We can't do it without making cuts. And we know that. And so, and as painful as that's going to be, it, it's the job we have to do. We intend to bring back to the board in September for um, for discussion, some items that we believe will make deeper cuts than than these skim the surface. It's what we could do right now in, in the month and a half we had in between board meetings and while moving schools and doing all the things we're doing. Um, but we are, we have identified deeper cuts that we need to make sure that we have um, lined out and, and that, that we can do now. Some of those will, um, will require uh, the board's approval. Some we can do, we'll be bringing that information back to in September. We're not going to stop until we get to that 2.5 million and the superintendent, um, Garbolino Mojica came in um, at our board meeting and she said, we have to cut 2.5 million. I can still hear those words. We're, we're going to find a way, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy and it's, and it's not going to be fun. Right. And I'm but sorry, we definitely said intend to do that. Additional 2.5 million. Cause here it says that it's projected to decline by more than 2.5 million. So are you talking about <laughs> additional? Cause we've already hit She's referring to the letter of going concern and all the okay. language that we've already heard. That was nothing new that she said. Yeah. She just was reminding us of that. And that has really stuck with me all summer. And, and CBO Leslie here. So um, not that our expenditures are continuing to decline, but that we continue to basically dig into the hole, $2.5 million. And that's, that's really where that came from. Um, and, and to reiterate what she said, you know, um, what she said, what interim Lucci <laughs> Garcia said is that, I mean, yeah, obviously, if we look at, um, as I kind of tried to say, you know, with a multi-year, even with those savings, um, with the deficit spending at $485,000, we're still projected to at then, if we were to take it out one more fiscal year, that's when we would hit that negative, negative budget number. So this, I mean, while his numbers are, again, a little bit different from where we sit right now, um, from the snapshot in time that he had, it, it's still the same concept. And keeping in mind that we're continuing to balance serving our students, 
you know, in, in the way that we know they need to be served and cutting the budget so that we have a district to continue serving students in. So we're being very mindful of that, which is why it's not easy to cut out, to, to line out the deeper cuts. You know, we have to be very thoughtful and mindful and we have to project um, what we believe is best for our students. So I, I, I know, I noticed that there are a number of, um, you know, like there's a review of financial reporting errors, which is, um, you know, lengthy, there's um, a, a series of recommendations. And so I'm thinking that I, I'm, I see some of them in here. So I think they've all been kind of operationalized in terms of like, how do we move forward in what we'll talk about later on the fiscal and operations action plan. So is that correct that all of the recommendations from this letter have made it into this plan. Into that sheet right there. Yes. Okay. So, and, and if you take a look at it, um, if you have it in, um, electronically or the hard copy, you'll see what we have done. It's checked off and there's a date yeah. and what we are working on. Now, there are some things we've done on here um, just literally recently that are not checked off yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm referring to this constantly to make sure that I'm doing what we need to be doing within this report. I did note that, well, I don't, so it was striking to me when I read Mr. Snelling's um, report, I mean, for a number of reasons, just that um, it's a steep learning curve to um, um, to do financial reporting and budget projections in a school setting and that it's very detailed and complicated work. But um, I mean, not only our, our precarious financial position, that there were a number of you know errors that have, had been made in the past that needed to be rectified and um and I, I mean just how much work we have to do um to right this ship and i think another thing that was interesting for me to see was that um there'd often been talk about moving the district office and trying to find a spot for it somewhere else, perhaps at Evie Kane, so that we had one fewer site to, um, and kind of more at furthering our consolidation effort. So I saw that that was one of his recommendations. And I guess we can get to the action plan later when that's also a separate agenda item. Um, I guess I wanted to ask the administration if they had particular takeaways from his letter that, um, I don't know, that were more meaningful or that um, what, well, what, what, what are we, what are we, so we're, we're creating this action plan in response to this, but it was a pretty, it was a pretty, um, detailed and, um, you know, upsetting letter to read really about our, our position and some of the, um, the things that need to be changed moving forward. This is president Holt. Um, I, I, I I think the administration's been demonstrating how they're taking this seriously and working on it. I, I don't think we need to try to turn this into a struggle session and go back over and go through it again. Um, I think I we've all seen the letter. It's publicly posted. And administration has been showing us the steps they're taking to address those action items. Um, so I don't know that we need to have them try to soul search here in front of the microphones in front of us to tell us what they found most meaningful. I don't know that that's helpful to the discussion right now. Okay, I just I think that we had had the chance to see the letter back in June when it came in, and I don't know that I think this is is this the first time it's been made public. I don't know that it would. I think it would just I, I perhaps was just received by the board previously. Um, yeah, I, I guess I I'm just hopeful that um, maybe we'll get to it later when we talk about the action plan. It was striking to me. Um, and I, I, mean, I don't know if it's beneficial to try to read a passage out of it. I just, I, I think we need to reflect on it is, is the point that I'm making that there, this was, it was a, a very thorough letter with a lot of um, feedback and recommendations for us. Now, are there any other questions on that letter, trustees? I well, I just want to say, I think one thing that he mentions that is something that we can really learn from and move forward with is that um, he talks a lot about the collective bargaining process and how 
you know, we approved agreements that were in excess of COLA in the past and that, um, that that's created problems for our district and that we need more kind of safeguards in place, such as having the two top administrators sign off on those agreements before they come to the board. And so um, when, when we've gone through this process, we've been, as, as trustees for the, um, over the, the last three years, you know, we were always assured that we could afford the agreement that we were reviewing. And so there just seems to be this disconnect that between, um, I, I think it's an opportunity for us to do better, right? That we went into those agreements believing that we could afford them and it's it's um, it's turned out that we can't. And so um, I thought that was an important point for us to stop and consider as a board is that as much as we have wanted to increase our salary scale so that we could be more competitive as an employer, um, something in that process over the years perhaps broke down and we were offering more than more than we should have been more than I, I shouldn't say should have but because we, we want to we want to offer what we can to our staff but perhaps we were offering more than we can afford okay. so so something about the checks and balances seems to have failed a bit sure. and this is president Holt again and so far I have confidence in what we've seen from uh, from the administration since some of these have come out. I mean, even the discussions we've had so far today, um, $708,000 in eliminating positions, which also we know that uh, interim superintendent was advised not to cut that position uh, for the assistant super for ed services mm -hmm. um, because that's where she came from. And so she's still an interim superintendent. And if she's to not become the superintendent, then she's out that position. So um, I think she's demonstrated that she is moving forward um, and taking this very seriously and trying to find these cuts. So every other bit of counsel I've received from her, uh, I, I've seen the same. So um, I, I don't have some of the same concerns. I think uh, our current administration is going to be telling people those hard truths um, and letting people know uh, what we can and can't afford. So that's uh, I am confident in what I've seen so far. I'm looking forward to our meeting in September when we're going to see some more recommendations coming in front of us. Um, Clerk Berkler, was there anything else in particular you wanted to highlight before we move on from that? Um, I'm not at this time. Okay. Uh, I do have one thing that I'd like to add, Trustee Ross. Um, the last thing on here is it says it will take all stakeholders understanding and communicating the scope of the problem and then working together to avoid the need for a state loan and potential takeover. And I think this goes back to our consultant um, just making sure that this communication does get out so that we can fully be transparent because I know a lot of parents are under a lot of different definitions of what this looks like. And there's a lot of anger about closing two schools and not hitting this budget yet. And so I, I just want to really enhance this communicating with all stakeholders. So if we are going to use AG, 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 thank you, AG on consulting, that we really take them up on understanding this and the value of this. So that would... Okay. All right. Um, on that note, let's move forward to item 11C, review of potential board meeting dates for 2024. So um, these... <laughs> This is interim superintendent Lucy Garcia. These are dates that we are proposing to you for you just to review and give us feedback on. Um, this is something that um, we do each year and um, we just wanna make sure that they're in front of you. Sometimes there are conflicts or, you know, things that we we can't predict. And so we just wanna put them in front of you. You can let us know what you think and then we'll move forward and um, we'll bring them back to you for action later in December. Yeah, I'm learning that process. This is uh, Vice President Wedge. Um, one comment I want to make on that is there is another um, engagement on the uh, second or, yeah, the second Wednesday of every month that, um, you know, the past year I haven't been able to take part in. Um, if it's okay with the board that we can, you know, possibly look at moving this to a, um, I like the Wednesdays. I think we all can agree on the middle of the week Wednesdays, you know, possibly the first or the uh, third Wednesday of the month instead of the second. This is present hold. I have no objection. Does anybody have an objection to that? 
Um, I have things going on at, at least the first Wednesday of every month, and I'm not sure about the third, um, but the first and third Wednesdays may be hard for me. I think there might be some specific reasons why we do meet the second Wednesday, because there are these different deadlines that we have to meet. I guess I'm thinking about sometimes there's um like there's a very specific window for the December meeting. It has to occur within between this date and that date. So I I understand that it's challenging when you have a conflict like that. I think maybe we need to ask administration if that's feasible to yeah, and I can work with that. I understand it. if it's a month here, a month there, we got to do the second Wednesday. I'm okay with that. So, Changing the day of the month would also require a change to the bylaws because it mm -hmm. specifies in the bylaws. So we would have to make those changes, bring it back to the board for approval. Gotcha. Thank you. So uh, Vice President Wedge, do you have a specific request for administration to look at, you know, are we looking at a different Wednesday or a different day. Yeah, a different day or Wednesday or even, um, you know, like uh, as far as uh, deadlines that we brought up, if it, you know, um, how do we come to the conclusion to the second Wednesday, you know, of every month? I'm trying to think of, for example, when we have um, a deadline where we have to let staff know whether or not they'll be, uh, whether they'll be pink slipped. Those are middle of the month in March, I believe. So there's certain deadlines that we have to often have our meeting prior to. And we, we can work around some of that. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking all, all, also of that, like the warrant report, which doesn't come out until just before, you know, right around the first or um, that type of thing. But then then that would just, if the board chooses to change and we change the bylaws and go through all the process, then we would just adjust like when you get that report, it may be on the next or, you know, however that plays out. And that's just my example right now. So um, does it have to be a Wednesday? I mean, could we do the Tuesday? and just change this all one day over? I mean, would that kind of work for folks too? Does yeah, I don't be, think it has to be a Wednesday. Be but I gave it towards change Thursday though, because it gives staff a little bit more time to, um, yep. I don't know, you know, to, to have everything prepared. There's a lot of stuff going on Thursdays, including like city council. Um, that might be more of a conflict. I mean, I, I think I would defer to staff, you know, if, whether it was a Tuesday or a Thursday. Touche. Um, so maybe the request is then that you know, if the administration would, let us know a good alternate day, um, you know, maybe give us a proposal and then we could talk about it next at the next meeting. Perfect. We have to approve this or it's already in the bylaws. This is just to let us know. We would have to change mm -hmm. the bylaws. Yeah. Right. We'd have to approve that, but we don't have to approve this at this. Discussion. Nope. This is for this discussion, which is very helpful for us because we could just push dates to you and just say vote on this, yeah. but we don't want to do that. We want to be collaborative. So, because mm -hmm. I know we're working around things like vacation schedules. We had to move a meeting one time because there was like the February break was during yeah. the time when we would have been meeting. So I, I know there's so many considerations that you take into account to get us even to this um, proposed calendar here. Okay. We'll, we'll take a look at that. This is clerk, De De trustee Dowd, I'm sorry. Um, I personally, if it means anything, I don't mind keeping it for the second Wednesday like we agreed to and like it has been. I mean, we already finalized that it would work with our schedule. We would work around the rest of our schedules. We organized so that we had our first Wednesdays already planned. Can we please just keep it? Except for February 14th. <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> maybe we might have dates. <laughs> well, that's yes, we with the administration. Thing. Right. Yeah. With <laughs> our duties on the, as a board. Okay, so thank you, administration. Mm -hmm. uh, moving forward to item 11D, professional development dates. Um, all right. Okay, so as you read um, in the PICMAT report and multiple other reports, it's important for um, the board to have um, training and specifically governance and specifically budget. And so the question came to me about um, where are we going to have governance training when we just developed the handbook and we had all that training for that. And my response is that really this governance training is more geared toward the Brown Act and um, and meeting and running the meeting, right? Our, our rules of order, um, because I know that those are areas that we all sometimes need to look in our book <laughs> to check. I've done that. Um, and so, and, and, Additionally to that is that this is standard practice when there's a new board members or a new superintendent. And so while I'm, I am 
the interim right now, I, I would benefit as well as you will from having this training together. Um, so we put together some date options for both um, governance training that is not handbook, but different governance training. And then also um, Superintendent Garbolino Mojica um, put together some dates for us to have our budget workshop through PCOE. What times are these? Or are these just broad as in these days still? Um, so the, the times, you know, we, we can just, we can determine the time that we have the governance meeting. Um, the last time was five to seven. Is it still that? Yes. Five to seven. And we, we recognize the need to do, you know, to have evening meetings and, and so does, um, PCOE. Um, I would request that we strike out Thursday, um, uh, September 7th, because it's kids of Palooza. Yay. Kids of Palooza. Oh. So this is oh. President Holt. Um, let's. Can we try to resolve the first block sure. of dates yeah. before we go to the second one? Even though I've struck that from the list. Okay, <laughs> so um, our first block of dates, let's just knock this out unless anybody needs to look at their calendars. Um, we've got Monday the 18th, Friday the 22nd of September, Wednesday the 25th of October, and Monday the 30th of October. Um, How's the 18th for folks? Uh, that's the best. I, I prefer that because then we could even try and do the next Monday and get them both of them. No. All right. I'm, I'm open on the 18th. All right. The 18th has it. And that's the budget. I'm, I'm going to ask Governor. for this. Oh, thank you. The mm -hmm. 25th. Yeah. Maybe. That would be 918. Mm hmm Okay. All right. Um, and I know you're saying the next Monday. Mondays are actually the hardest night of the week for me. So I'm happy to do Monday the 18th. <laughs> but... So my wife is usually working by herself, and so she has to stay late. Then it's childcare, and it's this whole big thing. So there, is there a um, fourth day? Oh, how about so on Wednesday? that next block, the Wednesday the sixth? Nine six. Can we do that? That works uh, for me. That's coming up. That's your two weeks. Two weeks. I can do nine six. That's fine. Okay. All right. That work for you? I'm glad I'm not on a honeymoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Nine six it is. Uh, may I ask about the PCOE budget workshop? I I was wondering, is there, um, should we be advertising this? Is this something that people in our school community might benefit from, so that they can learn about how to interpret budgets as well? I mean, is it? I I think because it it was a special board meeting when we first tried to schedule it, there was a twenty four hour notice, so people may, you know, they we knew that it was coming, but they didn't necessarily. So it was just a thought that it might be beneficial to the public at large it will be geared to to your learning at your level of governance but it is a special board meeting so anyone's welcome to come will it be on zoom available on zoom um because i know not all of our special it's a special so according no it we went i keep looking at kirsten because she's coordinating <laughs> most of this no it's a special so our specials are not on zoom However, the public is, of course, welcome to attend Absolutely. in person. And so this means we're signing up for three meetings in September. I'm just mentioning that for us mm -hmm. all, right? So we'll have the 6th, the 13th, and then the 18th. It's the 13th. Yeah. All right. Um, oh. And then our our special board meetings being recorded, like these board meetings, or no, because it's not on Zoom? Okay. All right, moving right along. Don't have my next page. No, thank you. All right, transition and integration rebranding. And and uh, so Clerk Brickler. Yep, presented. Clerk Brickler. Okay. Um, I had asked that this item be placed on the agenda because it's a really a follow-up from where we left off in um, February. So I was looking back, I was trying to remember where in our discussions about school consolidations we had, there had been a board discussion or two about this idea that um, because we had two schools in North Auburn and they were being brought together onto one campus that we had, um, you know, we had several discussions about how we would transition the the students onto one campus, whether or not we would consider a, a new identity for that school. And so um, I think it just kind of perhaps fell off our 
radar back in February, we had discussed the possibility of a transition and integration committee. And we had talked about a, a bit about um, how we would approach um, you know, changing school names, mascots, colors, and in an effort of um, you know, offering something new and creating something new together in North Auburn. Um, and so <clears throat> we just hadn't touched this topic for a few months. And now that we schools open, um, I wanted to bring it back again. Um, so let me just pause since that's where we left it and see if um, you have any input, any thoughts on how to pick this up. Um. Vice President Wedge, I remember the conversation. I think how it was it was paused, it was stopped because it was the uh, the cost um, that would that would come with it. Oh, I what I would propose, I what I would really like to see is a really kind of student and staff driven effort. And I know there's a lot on people's plates. So I think that they would need time to do this. I, I I'm not a proponent of it being a consultant driven effort with a hefty price tag. I don't think we we don't have the money to pay for a twenty five thousand dollar rebrand, and I don't think that's what anyone is really um, looking for. Sometimes that doesn't feel that feels hollow. It doesn't feel. I, I'm I'm talking about. Um, could we give our North Auburn Elementary School um, as much time as they need this this year to have discussions about, um, you know, who they want to be together as a as a new newly formed campus and. Um, have I would love to see students heavily involved in determining a name. Um, I say students and staff, but um, to kind of build some excitement about this new school that we've created in um, in North Auburn. So I I don't I think it could be done in a way where we don't have an expensive price tag. I mean, what what I guess you know over time you're spending money on um, you know changing signage and things like that, but. Um, I wasn't anticipating spending the money on. No, and I think that would be a great project for the school, you know, the community at large. You know, I think the community, if that's something, if that's something the, uh, the students want, that's something the community wants. And I think the community, you know, most definitely can come together and even finance this as well. And I think it can be a great project for the students to go out and, uh, you know, and really, you know, sell this idea to the community. This is President Holt. Um, I'm just going to be blunt. I think it's entirely unnecessary. Um, uh, I think the, the school is integrating, um, it will continue to integrate. Um, it doesn't need a rebrand that will be expensive, um, because it does include signage changing, um, anything that's published, um, and, and going on changing all sorts of things that we aren't even anticipating yet. So, um, I mean, again, just to be blunt, I, I don't think it's necessary. Um, this is Trusty Ross and, when you talk about integration, I definitely believe you got to enter the school and feel the culture and climate because there is a lot of hostility between teachers, between students. And this type of thing has been spoken about as a coping or as a healing process, restorative justice, however you want to uh, say it. It has been brought up several times, not by just teachers, not by just parents, but by students that it would actually help the culture of the school. So I do believe just attending that school, um, I'm, I have to say that I am so impressed right now with how people are dealing with things, but there's, it's, it's not what it could and should be. And this president <laughs> hold again, uh, I think our students and our children will follow our example as adults, um, and role models. And so if we work on promoting a positive integration, that's what we will get. Um, if we tell people to mourn, they will mourn. So I think it's on us to set an example. Okay. Again, I just ask you to come on that campus. Just take a trip, maybe come during lunch, hang out, and just see for yourself or during recess and see what's going on. This is Trusty Dowd. I do believe that it is very important to create team building for the whole district. These are all going to be students together at EV King if we work together at the elementary level. Okay. It's it's creating a new atmosphere, yes, but it's bringing them together for a new community. It's I think it's really important that we keep the name because it has been Auburn Elementary for this long. Yes, it is a new community, but maybe it's 
a, a new after school program to create to connect them, a new team building um, um, level of leadership. I mean, it it needs to be about creating that positive atmosphere in this campus that they already are on. I, I was thinking about the workload that would be involved if the staff were to want to um, undertake this. And, uh, you know, I want to be really um, sensitive to, you know, what a heavy load it is for our staff to, um, you know, have integrated um, and to consolidated schools. So I guess my my thinking was that if we were to support this and move forward with it, that we would give them, you know, like the 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 school year to think this through and to figure out when the time was right to um to create this new identity for the school, and that would give them until perhaps like an implementation of a new identity in in the twenty four twenty five school year. So I don't want to rush it if if we were to do this want to be thoughtful about the st the the time involved. So since we're not making a decision, is this something you want to put back on the agenda later? Oops. After Thank you. people have had time? I was just going to ask if this is something that you would like us to um, do a little more research on and then put back on, or would you like to, you know, what what's your direction for me? Um, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, um, I mean, we have a, you know, a lot of things to worry about that we need to deal with at the point. And, um, and I think that this is an idea, you know, from, uh, you know, from the school, I haven't been on the site, you know, I haven't experienced the, uh, um, you know, the environment. Um, but, you know, I wasn't supported this, you know, from the get, from the very beginning of them coming in, you know, that, that time has passed. And if, if this is something that they want, I mean, they can bring it to us. Um, you know, at this point, I don't think we need to really spend a whole lot of time on this ourselves, you know, until, you know, until there's a need. And right now I don't really see a huge need. It's, it's an idea coming from the board. So you would, you're saying that, um, you would be more motivated if you heard from the school community themselves, that this is something that they wanted rather than us proposing it as a board. Correct. I, okay. I feel like that would just put a negative comment out there if we urged the school to try and tell us that we need to change the school. I think that it would really backtrack for how far we've tried to help this school come together as a community, as a new part of the district. And I think that just telling them that it's negative and that it's not going well and that we should change it and that you should tell this, the board that it is negative could create a more negative atmosphere than look at how much we can do to make this a better one. What can we do to, what would you wanna to do to make this better? Not how can we make it negative? This is President Holt again. Um, and you know, this item also mentioned E.D. Kane um, and that's another one where it's just, uh, uh, I, I don't see where we have the room in our budget to spend time and money um, trying to rebrand and change names or colors or I think that was an easy one I don't mean to cut you off I apologize trustee Ross um, when leadership Auburn was working with Evie Kane it was a suggestion to take off the Evie leave the cane and then make a cougar instead of a wildcat so it's the same concept and it's not a lot of rebranding it's a simple structure that's something you well, and th there was also um, the talk about changing the color as well, okay. which which is why why I think um, last year when this came to everybody, we just said, "Ooh, let's you know hold on a minute," because of that that uh, all the changes. But but again, that's why I'm bringing it back, so I can get direction from you all about what you um, want me to do next. Uh, perhaps we can, I, I'm not against hearing from the principals. I think this was the principal's ideas in the first place. So maybe if we can just get their feedback before we pursue anything. Absolutely. It would be, uh, it would be their workload really. I mean, they would, they would be integral to thinking through um, um, any sort of change to the, the name or mascot. <laughs> so I think we're asking to hear from the principals of those two sites. Um, sure. 
I have two in favor of that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Moving on to item. So I'm sorry, where does that leave us? So we, you only had two in favor of hearing from the principals. Um, so the majority of the board would direct me to do the next steps. And so, so far I have two that want to hear from the principals and it doesn't, I don't, I don't hear any others. So then that would just mean that this would, would sit. And then I would wait for your direction or this, you know, what we're going to do with this next. So I'm as you direct. So moving to item 12 B, excuse me, 12 board governance. Um, with 12A board policy updates, uh, the second read and adoption for what we read back in March. So um, this this second read um, would, would require board approval. So um, administration recommends approval of these um, board policy changes. So first read is stays there and goes on two months. This is the second read. This is the time that we vote. Um, I move that we approve item 12A um, board policy updates from March, 2023. <laughs> I second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. And item 12B board policy updates, it's June, 2023, the first read. So, so th this is another very thick packet of board policy for you to, um, to read through. Um, and we'll bring it back for approval next month. And 12C, uh, board policy updates, updated contact information only. So um, these are board policies that are, the policies are not changing themselves. It's just the contact information. And the reason being is that the people in the positions are not in the positions and now the positions, positions aren't even there. So what we've done is instead of change the name every time we change the staff member that's responsible, we are just going to put the title um, of the position that will be conducting the investigation or be in charge of, of the specific component of these um, these policies. So um, administration recommends approval of these contact information changes. Uh, this is President Holt. I move that we approve those contact information changes. This is Clerk Brickler, I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And those opposed? All right carries. And to item 12D, update on requests. Um, okay, so request one, um, the International Baccalaureate Program, it was asked that we take the survey and we determine um, if, you know, if this will work for our district at this time. And I'm going to be really honest with you, the, um, oh, we lost our program person. I have not been able to hire another program person and I have not had the time. Now, my thought this weekend was, I'll just sit down and get it done. And then, and then 20 other things came up that needed me to respond to them. So I apologize, but I'm going to have to come back with this um, information for you in September. Just President Holt, um, I, I'm kind of really hung up on the costs and things from what we were briefed on the IB program. You know, the IB program's got a lot of things going for it. I don't know that we're in a position to be able to adopt that in the next three years. Um, so uh, is that something we even want to hear that update on at this point? I think we were also trying to capitalize on the things we've already invested in, like mm -hmm. Project Lead the Way and not wanting to lose that momentum on um, things we've invested in. So, um, I, and I understand that the, the, I think the request was in part coming from what are some of the things we can do to make, um, to offer something unique mm -hmm. that might increase enrollment or be something that you know, would be, um, yeah, bring folks from outside districts. So uh, I understand the intent behind it, but I, I think <coughs> our list of priorities is rather high or rather large. It's a, we have a lot of other priorities. So with that, um, we kind of get the approval of the board here. If we all just kind of give nods to the interim superintendent, um, do we want to get an update on this next month or do we need to just kind of table this for a while? I'm in favor to table it. I'm fine with tabling it. Likewise. Okay. So it looks like the board's unanimous there. Let's just okay. put a pin in that. Thank you. 
And then um, the other request that you had was a report out on how we are um, going to respond to the FECMAT report. And I know we touched on this a, a little bit um, earlier today, but um, the FECMAT report is this, this document. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will let Heather Leslie speak to it a little bit. Um, but what I can tell you before she starts is she took that thick mat report, she lifted it up and she plopped it right into a Google sheet and then, um, and then put those little completed, um, which I love the check marks because you can just click it and it's checked it done when, when you're done. So CBO Leslie. Oh, thank you. So this is CBO Leslie. And essentially, yes, what, what this this thought process was, as we had kind of discussed in prior meetings, was not only taking the FICMAT report, but those recommendations that we ended up getting. Um, from the fiscal expert. And then also um, we had um, anything from prior letters um, that were um, in really the audit report. So I mean, the audit report, I think, was the bigger one for me because those were things that we talked about, like, you know, how, how can we make sure that these don't happen again? How do we make sure that, like, we're covering these things? And so the biggest thing, I think, the biggest piece for me is the column that's labeled source. That's where you're going to see where that's noted. And the common theme as I went through this is it's noted over and over again. So it was in the audit report and then it was listed in the FICMAT report, the same thing about the audit report. And then you see the big chunk inside the fiscal experts um, report or letter. And that also addressed all of you know the things that were in the audit report. So it, it really, it crosses over many times. So there's a lot of items, but you'll notice either they're mentioned a couple of times um, during the FICMAT report in different sections. And those uh, those are numbered and mentioned um, so that each item is spoken for that was inside those reports. Um, a few of the things that I'd wanna point out is, as we looked at the FICMAT report um, specifically, and then also the audit uh, report, those were things that were based on, the audit was based on a year end, and the FICMAT report, they had to go based on last year's first interim. So we're already kind of edging up on first interim this year, so there were they really were looking at a picture of over a year ago when they came in, and they, and they were very clear about that. So many of the things that had been mentioned or had been mentioned in auto report were already kind of tied up by second interim. So they're still mentioned in here. And then it has, um, you'll see a date that's maybe like a back date and, and then a check off that it, it's been completed. And then the description as you go in through um, the action column, that's where it'll line out when that was taken care of or how that was taken care of. So really the things that um, as we move forward on these, go, looking at them or where these things are still have outstanding open check boxes. And really a lot of them um, are going to say ongoing. And those are because those were things that we really just couldn't say, yep, we're done with deficit spending, check the box. Um, they're going to be ongoing items that we deal with, um, including as we looked at training um, further down into the plan. Um, you know, both, you know, really for all staff, you know, for the interim superintendent, for the board, those are things that are ongoing as we continue to look at that governance training, or we look at the budget training from Placer County Office of Education. Um, they just weren't things that we could just check the box, yes, they're done. Um, we were still waiting for dates and things like that on it. Um, I did find one as I was poking through this on a, on a back page where I missed a checkbox. So just know that it should be checked, but it's not, the dates on it is correct. Um, but really this um, addresses each, it, they're labeled in categories from the FICMAT report. And then um, again, you know, the number that was listed out on the FICMAT report is inside of that source column. Were there any um, ones that you particularly wanted to point out in terms of Superintendent Lucci Garcia? Um, I... I believe I, I pointed out some that were very important, and that and that is that that training um, for for you all, um, so that you have that expertise and that um, that ability to kind of dive in, especially with that budget uh, piece. And then and then how hard we're working on position control and um, our special education budget as well. Thank you for creating this so that we can. Um, make sense of the various recommendations. I know it's large, we've gotten. but I, I think it necessitated it. it so, yeah. Uh, See, Dowd, um, I, I like seeing so much either still ongoing or completed or with a finalization of at least fall. I mean, that's phenomenal that so much is processed and getting there. 
This is President Holt. Uh, yeah. Thank you for getting this knocked out for us and thanks for sharing it with us whenever we ask to kind of take a peek later as we go forward. Uh, just you know, keep us looped in if anything comes up, there's any hiccups with it. And it's CBO um, Leslie, but I think it's it's also probably warranted as we get through like fall or maybe even into first interim, just, you know, I think we're both comfortable adding this as just another information item. Um, it doesn't even have to go into discussion, but then that way it's public and you can see yeah. what else has been kind of checked off or if any dates change or anything of that nature. Yeah. This present Holt, are there any other additional questions or comments on that? Seeing none, if you want a new request. Um, I know I um, kind of asked you for what austerity measures look like um, to get us uh, back on, you know, what isn't definitely depending. How bad does that look? How do we do today? Uh, see if we have any other requests as well. I have, I have a couple requests. Um, uh, one that's been, it, it's been discussed in, um, Michelle Lucci Garcia, I appreciate your time because I know I took time out of your schedule to discuss this, but just to update us on the policy and flow charts that you're putting together for procedures and how we're working through maintenance work orders. What does that look like so that we can see what the process is, who's held accountable, who's doing what? Um, that would be my first request, and I believe that you're already in the midst of that um the the one that we spoke about um i when you and i talked was um that i wanted to make a flow chart for communication and how we communicate out and so but i but i heard you say on work orders is that is that the same idea or is it is something is it an, another layer i want to make sure that if if this is the direction that i do everything that you're asking um i think i must have misunderstood so i apologize Yes, I like the communication and the flow of how that's okay. going to work, of course. And I think that's kind of tied into maintenance and how okay. things are getting fixed. Sure. I don't know that we actually need maintenance work orders, but how does that process work? How do things go through? I don't know if that's maybe a workshop down the line we have with maintenance. I, I don't know how that works, but I, I would like to know how that process goes from the time someone puts in a work order to the time it gets done. Um, that would be my first request. So um, is the board interested in having a workshop um, from our MNO department on? Maintenance come in and give their work. They're coming, I believe, in November. I'm going to look at that. I think it's November. I think for for me, I'm I'm interested in, in just a kind of a status update. I know there's been a, a, a number of um, maintenance projects underway to prepare the sites. And um, where are we in terms of... Um, you know, changing out faucets that that contained lead. Um, I wasn't aware until tonight that there was also like a lead faucet issue perhaps at another school site. Um, so I think just kind of an overall like high level update on what what kind of work is being done and what are the remaining issues that we're working to resolve would be helpful. I guess this President Holt, um, could that maybe go out as an email as well? Because um, we could probably get copied in. I'm sure some of that stuff is already digital. Um, if you could just kind of CC the board on that, um, that might resolve a little bit quicker. Another okay. Google Doc. So I'm hearing um, update on policies and procedures on the work order process is an update that the board would like via email. Um, and then uh, potentially a workshop, but we have MNO coming in anyway to, um, oh, sorry, to give a presentation. So maybe we can infuse that into that presentation unless the board would prefer a workshop, which is more lengthy. Um, and then I'm hearing um, that you would like a status on where we are with the lead testing and the fixtures that need to be replaced due to um, now there are fixtures that need to be, be that need to be replaced due to um to lead but also some that just need to be replaced so we can give you an update on all of that so that you can sort it through and and fully understand um i wouldn't just want to inform you on one component of that i would want to give you the whole picture i think it's a request for an overall kind of facilities and you know, safety concern update I, I, it's not just the faucets it's that we heard about a number of other issues so with that, so, but I'm hearing that you want that in an email. So that, but that, but when you say that, you know, facilities and safety that I have 
10 million things in my mind that you want to hear about. So I'd like to drill that down so that I, so I get the information you need without doing things you don't need, if that makes sense. Um, so can, if you could be specific for me and I will, I will make my list and I will get that done for you. So I, so I have update on faucets. I have I don't even um, know what the work order are. process. We don't, know. we don't always necessarily hear what the issues are at the sites. Um, I mean, unless we're out walking and, and talking, we walking and talking to folks, which is you know, always a good practice, but like, I hadn't heard about the, um, the, the warped wall that might have water damage until tonight. Um, I think earlier this summer, we, we were getting some updates, right? We were hearing that these various th tasks need to um, occur before the school sites are ready for students. Yes. And, and, it's, and it's, like, it's more like at a higher level of what are the main concerns that we're trying to resolve on our school sites. Okay. And, and I, I remember that you also wanted, you had one updates on those portables and I, and I did continuously send you pictures and give you updates. So um, I have no problem with that. I just want to make sure, because to your point, there are a million things and we don't know what we don't know. And that includes, that includes me. So I, I am more than happy to, um, to update you on everything you need updating. If, if this is what you would like, but I, um, I'd like to drill it down because I, I don't want to, go to m and say, okay, tell me all the things I don't know, and then type it all up and send it to you. I, I feel like that won't be useful to you in quite what you're asking. And I'm not trying to make light of a serious situation. So please understand that. I just want to make sure that I'm getting you what you need in a timely manner. So, um, so I'll, I'll just listen. What if it was like the top three things that the maintenance staff is concerned about the top three things that they aren't able to resolve and the top three things that we've been hearing about, maybe. Would that be a decent way to get a, a good breed? Um, I, I'm hearing about a, a like electrical and so, and I don't know if that's something, you know, that anybody else has heard of. So it might be hard, but I just, uh, Safety. I think if it comes down to our students and our, our staff's safety, that we should know about it. This is President Holt. Um, are the uh, are the principals at these sites reporting these issues um, to the to the administration? So um, there are well, the things that are reported to me, I bring to you um, the things that some things don't get reported to me because they don't require my level of, of, of knowledge because they're being handled. Right. right. Um, it's when the, it's when something has gone wrong in the handling of, or the situation got deeper, um, that it comes to me. And then that's when I sit down with the team and I try to figure out how are we going to resolve this situation? So, um, I, I am very careful to report everything to you all that comes my way because I don't want you to be blindsided or go to a site. You're always going to go to a site and hear things that I, don't, that I haven't told you because there's lots I don't know. Um, that's going to happen. And I, and I've, I've accepted that. Um, but I don't want you to be blindsided about something that I know about and that I can share with you. So I, I will be very diligent in continuing that practice. That is, that is one of my communication priorities, right? Um, so I can look into electrical. I can look, I, I can give you, um, some response about walls and um, definitely water and fixtures. If that, if those are three things that you're hearing that you're concerned about, we can do the top three. Um, we can do it any which way. I, I just, I hesitate to say everything and anything because that could be literally things you're like, Michelle, really, but, but it could be a safety issue, right? Like, I'll just use one that's a priority, hot topic. People wearing flip flops and they trip. Do you want to know about that? You know, you probably don't. You know, and that that that's like my my example because that's like the fresh example that's on all of our. You know, we kind of joke about the flip flop thing. Um, so again, not to make light, but just to help you understand where I'm coming from. Um, absolutely priority, absolutely safety. Um, we bring things your way that um, are litigious or um, that our insurance has to deal with. I mean, things that you really need to know, I try to bring to you. So I will absolutely be mindful of that practice as well to make sure that when I'm bringing, that I'm bringing you um, information in a timely manner. But I also, as information comes to me, it takes me a second sometimes to kind of figure out what's going on and dig into it, you know, sure. um, and then turn it back around to you because I don't want to just say, oh my gosh, we had a crisis. I'll get back to you. 
and leave you hanging either. I, I want to come to you with the problem and then with the solution, um, which I can change that practice as well. If that's what you choose, um, yeah, you. No, I, I, I will do what you need. Good. I will do what you need. Thank you. Uh, this is President Holt again. And also thank you for, you know, pushing some of these back down or making sure that if it's up to the site administrators that they are resolving it because not everything needs to come to your attention. Not everything needs to come to our attention. Um, you know, if there are issues like tripping on flip-flops or probably even some cracks in the pavement and other smaller things that are always going to happen, that doesn't necessarily require your time or our time. Um, you know, it should be handled at the appropriate level. So I think there just may be some confusion about like what the process is for handling facilities issues when they're on a site. I, I think that that's, um, that's one of the communication issues is if it's identified, it's reported, what are the next steps? How do we get it resolved in a timely manner? Because, you know, there's some things that we heard about in June that it appears were not resolved by the start of the school year. And we weren't really getting updates about the status. And there was some confusion about who's about roles and who was ultimately responsible for resolving a situation. So, maybe. so it'd just be very helpful to speak to kept to be kept apprised. I mean, we we I guess we can keep asking. I can keep emailing about what, where where we are with things. But no, this President Holt, um, yeah, potentially another meeting we could have maybe maintenance on hand, or they could even just give us kind of a their top. These are the big things that we're seeing at the sites, um, and maybe they could explain that process of how a request goes um, if they would be the appropriate ones to deliver that. Um, but it seems like. Uh, you know, as long as it is working the way it's supposed to, that's what we want it to do. Not everything has to come to, obviously, the district level. Not everything has to come to the level of board. Um, but we want to make sure that our school sites, um, that our administrators and our teachers know what that process looks like, I guess. Because if there's a breakdown in communication, it seems like that is um, on the staff side, that maybe some of our staff don't know what that looks like. Um, because they're the ones who should be reporting this, not yeah. necessarily board members. I think it's more, I don't know. I, I don't have a full understanding of the situation. My, I, I think one piece I'm hearing is that um, some staff are making reports, but then it's kind of unclear, like who holds the responsibility to kind of finalize the um, the steps needed to resolve the issue. Because it's a kind of a multi-pronged, there's multiple departments in, involved with the resolution. Um, just for the sake of time, because it is getting late. Yeah. Uh, I, what Sir Clerk Brickler is saying, I think is already in our updates that you're going to update us on procedure. So we, we are already, we're, we're developing a, a process for how all departments and sites, um, report out and communicate because that's, that's something that, um, that we need. Um, for instance, I emailed um, somebody today to ask uh, a question, and then that person said, oh, I already told that other person. So th these kinds of things, the, you know, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. And and I, I know you know this, but, um, you know, we're limiting a position. We can't hire another. I'm trying to do all these things, and I, and I, and I want to do the absolute best job. I love our district. I want to do the best. But I'm going to be really honest. I am one person, and I my goal is to develop processes and procedures that we can put in place and develop a system. And I think everybody um, who know who's known me and I look into because I anyway, um, at services, you know, in front of every group of everything I've ever done, I've said we need to develop a system because we need consistency. And and that and I am absolutely working on that. And and that is something that I that I am committed to doing. And that has risen up to me to develop some kind of a procedure. Um, Kirsten already has my rough draft. If she can read my writing, she's going to start the flow chart, little graphic -y thing, because I don't even I can't even uh, that that'll be like, oh, my college, you know, work on the paper in the middle of the night thing. I can't. Kirsten's gifted with it. She's going to make that for me. I'm going to plug it in. I'm going to take it to our teams and and I'm going to vet it. And, and we're going to talk about it because everybody, all leadership and, and I, and I'm going to be really clear also. Um, um, and I've said this to, to you already. And I think to you as well, um, principals are the leader of the site. I'm never going to take their authority away from them at their site. They are, they are, they run the site 
And while we may have district initiatives, pr principals also have site initiatives and they have plans and goals and they vet that all through me because that's what we do. We communicate with each other. And sometimes I have to say, Ooh, we can't quite do that because that's the planting or we, you know, but long-term we don't have the budget or we can't, you know, those are conversations we have, but I, I take pride in the fact that the principals and I are very collaborative, but that, but that also doesn't mean that I'm going to step over them and go to their site and make a list of things that I need to, to, um, you know, to address on their behalf. So, so I, I take pride in the fact that when we have a glitch or a hiccup, we pick back up, we talk about it, we fix it, we move on. So this flow chart is my way right now because I can't get with the principals because we're all extremely busy to kind of have that talking point to come back and say, you know, everybody has a responsibility, but there is, to your point, President Holt, there is um, a responsibility at the site to um, to either handle it or tell me that they can't or tell me that they're handling it this way and then we have a conversation. And that's not because I don't want responsibility for the site. I absolutely take responsibility for our sites. That's my job. But I'm also not going to overstep the authority of the principal. The second I do that, then they lose everything they've built and that trust with their with their families and their and their students and their teams. So there's a dance, and and I feel like the principals and I have enough trust that we uh, that we can dance. And and when things get wonky, we fix it, and it takes time. Um, so to the point of building a system and creating the flow chart and doing all that, I, that's, that's what I'm doing in Auburn. And, and when I have that all done, then I can hand this all over to the next person who has a different skill set to make sure that it's maintained for years to come. But this is my gift and my talent. So I just want to make sure that the board is aware of that. I, I'm committed to that work. Um, so yes, the flow chart's getting worked on, the communication will get cleaned up, and there are things I don't know when they come to me. Sometimes I'm, you know, it's with a little bit of, oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> Let me figure this out. And sometimes I know exactly what to do, but you know, that's part of the learning because there are a million things and I can't even predict them all. Um, so that will come to you all because I'm already working on that. But as far as what you would like from me beyond that, I'm all ears because I'm ready to do whatever you need. Are we all in agreement for that last part? We got yeah. what we needed. Um, I just have two, I'm gonna make them very short. Um, my second request would be, there was a lot of exit interviews done. And yes. I think we were supposed to hear about that, or I don't know if that's a closed session, open session, I'm not sure, but I would I would love to hear the results of the exit interviews. So that was scheduled to be presented tonight by um, Michelle Bent, our human resources manager. However, she is also doing back to school nights okay. and um, she is completely um, swamped and she did not tell me she can't do it. I went into her desk and I said, I'm going to postpone your presentation. She said, I can do it. And I said, nope, I'm postponing your presentation. So I apologize. I own that. But I also know how far to push staff members. Michelle is working very hard to get the year started. And there's a lot of hiring. And then all of the fingerprinting process, which I know we've talked about a little bit as well, um, that all has to be district level at, at some point. And so she scooped that up and she's doing all that work. And I just decided we're going to push that to September. So next month, you are lucky to get two presentations instead of one, um, but that is because I did push that out. And I meant to update you on that, so I apologize for not sending that email to you sooner. Okay, great. Uh, my last uh, request is um, the Placer Wellness Centers. I'd love to see where we're at with them. I know our grant's supposed to be done next year. I heard there was more funding for them to come. Um, I'd love to know why there's one counselor at EVK, and I don't know if this is up to us, and three at Auburn Elementary, but um, I don't know. Sure. I'm sorry. Or not uh, counselor, wellness sorry. person or counselor? counselor. I'm sorry. Wellness, wellness people. There's like okay. three at Auburn L. There's one at EV Kane. And I apologize. I, I think there's two at Sky Ridge. Okay. Um, but anyways, I just want to know, maybe we can get a some update from them. Maybe Placer County wellness centers can come in and tell us um, impact assessment. I'd love to see what type of impact this is having on our students. Is it working? Is this something we need to follow through with? Um, is that something that the board would like Kelly Young to come and present on since she oversees the wellness centers? Or is that something the board would like to hear from directly from Placer County Office of Ed? Um, I, I would love to hear from Placer County wellness centers themselves to see what the impact is and how things are going and how much longer did we extend our grant? Are they gone next year? What's that process? If they are gone next year, what are we? 
what are we going to do? And they, and they, they may not have information on what we're going to do about the grant because that, that would be a decision we make, but I'm more than happy if the board would, um, would like that to, um, see if they're even capable of coming in and doing that. This is president Holt, uh, trustee, uh, Ross, how soon do you want that? Are you thinking next month or can we push that out a little bit? Um, given already, we're kind of already packing September. I think the rest of our year is going to be packed. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, I I would love to know now in case we do have to start planning for next year. But if we need to pull it off a month, I, I can leave that up to you. And, like, and even if it's a status update, even yeah, I was email gonna... about kind of um, how much more time do we have with the grant? Are there any efforts to provide ongoing funding? Mm -hmm. Is that somewhat some of that part yes, of what you're looking that's part for. of it and then the impact the actual impact yeah. what are the role i don't even know what the actual role is of the wellness center so i'd love to see what they're doing because we still have counselors and behavioral therapists that have their roles and then there's the wellness role so i i would just love to see what that looks like this president holt again I, I think that raises a good question you know how do they measure success what what um do they have an objective metric that they look at that they can measure and tell us, yes, that we are having a positive effect in the school. Um, and this is where we see it with actual data. And how they're working with the schools to use that data to better our students, just to add on. Okay, so I have the wellness centers that concern about um, how they're staffed and I have that you would like an update on the grant and the impact of the grant the role of the wellness centers and the um, how they measure their success. Okay, so um, I will work, as it sounds like this is coming from at least three of you. Um, so I will work on um, their availability uh, because even if we want it in September, they may not even be available. And we have two presentations already, but again, if that's what the board chooses, that's fine. Um, but, uh, some of this information we would have to get you in-house because they're not going to have an update on um, on our use of the grant. Um, that would be something that Kelly Young, our director of student support, would have information on. So maybe I could get that information, get what I can in-house from Kelly, send you an email update, and then invite the wellness centers to come in and speak about how they measure their success and um, and their role in, in wellness. Is that reasonable? Okay. And if that means it's, a, one, it's an three. email then that's, that's an email's fine. But the, I would eventually love some kind of workshop where they come in and tell us. Okay. It's present all, I think, you know, maybe not a workshop, but just a presentation. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for Okay, thanks for clarifying. I, I apologize. You that off. Everything's a workshop to me. <laughs> See, those little words, like, do this thing to your heart, like, oh, and then, you know, <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Any new requests? A new clock for Evie Kane? Yeah, get some more hamsters there. <laughs> um, all right. Seeing no other requests, uh, it is what's the time right now? 9 45. 9 45, and this meeting is adjourned.